are elemental and enduring. And while we still struggle to uphold equal and inalienable rights of all, they remain ever steady and ever true. We cannot turn away from abuses, whether in Xinjiang, Tehran, Darfur, or anywhere else. We have to continue working to ensure that women and girls enjoy equal rights and equal participation in their societies, that indigenous groups, racial, ethnic, religious, minorities, people with disabilities do not have their potential stifled by systemic discrimination, that the LGBTQI plus people are not prosecuted or targeted with violence because of who they are. These rights are part of our shared humanity. They're absent when they're absent anywhere. Their loss is felt everywhere. They are essential the advancement of human progress that brings us together. My fellow leaders, let me close with this. At this inflection point in history, we're going to be judged by whether or not we live up to the promises we made to ourselves, to each other, to the most vulnerable, and to all those who will inherit the world we create, because that's what we're doing. Will we find within ourselves the courage to do what must be done, to preserve the planet, to protect human dignity, to provide opportunity for people everywhere, and to defend the tenets of the United Nations? There can only be one answer to that question. We must and we will. The road ahead is long and difficult, but if we preserve, persevere, and prevail, we keep the faith in ourselves and show what's possible. Let's do this work together. Let's deliver progress for everyone. Let's bend the arc of history for the good of the world, because it's in our power to do it. Thank you for listening. You're kind. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the United States of America for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. May I request, may I request representatives to remain seated while we suspend the meeting for five minutes before resuming to hear the next speaker.
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the meeting is resumed. The assembly, the assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Gustavo Petro Urego, President of the Republic of Colombia. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Gustavo Petro Urego, President of the Republic of Colombia, and invite him to address the Assembly. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask the, that the Assembly come to order to receive the statement of His Excellency Gustavo Petro Urego, President of the Republic of Colombia. Thank you. Gracias, eh, Antonio. Thank you. Antonio, Dennis, Dennis my wife, Veronica, and my youngest daughter, Veronica, here. I, a week ago, was in Santiago de Chile, and I've made my journey to here from there to commemorate the 50th anniversary of a homicidal and bloody coup against President Salvador Allende. I then went through my own country and a popular neighborhood of Medellin where the mafia used to attract young people to offer them the possibility of learning computer programming. I then arrived in Havana, an unjustly blockaded country where a president of my country suggested and achieved that it be included in the list of terrorist-sponsoring countries simply because it had helped to make peace in Colombia. And now I am here, ladies and gentlemen, to make my speech to you. Over this year, since the last speech that I gave in the United Nations, we have only seen a deepening of what the wealthy meeting in Davos call a polycrisis. The war is continuing. Hunger continues. The recession is increasing, and the climate crisis has shown its teeth as never before, claiming thousands of lives and heating our lands and our seas like never before. This has been a year where humanity has been losing and has unfailingly hastened the era of extinction. All of these crises are, in fact, just one crisis, the crisis of life. It seems that world leaders have become the enemies of life. The crisis of life is being expressed in one devastating indicator. This began at the furthest corners of the earth, far away from the remotest regions, a silent march of people from different cultures who are intermingling 
on their way, Como en una pintura like de an infinitely marches. nuanced painting. Los colores se van the colors en una are mixing together in an uncontainable march. A multitude of all the colors is moving mares, along the tracks, selvas, through the seas, through the jungles. It is making up a kind of work of art on the canvas of the earth. A flow of tones, sounds, different clothes and cultures in an amalgam which does not forget its beginnings. In an amalgam in a great march from the south to the north, this is the exodus of humanity which has begun. Today, there are tens of millions. Tomorrow, according to experts, by 2017, the figure will have reached three billion, fleeing from their beloved homes because these homes will be uninhabitable. In my homeland, the country of beauty, Colombia, the country of an explosion of life, by 2017, only deserts will remain. The people will go to the north, no longer attracted by the mirage of wealth, but rather by something simpler, something more vital, water. Since the beginnings, the millenary beginnings of humanity, people have gone to where water is, to the north. Billions of people will defy armies and will change the earth to do this. This exodus of the peoples to the north is an exact reflection of the dimension of the failure of governments. This last year has been a time of defeat for governments, of defeat for humanity. The exodus across the borders has increased. They have set the dogs and the hounds on the immigrants. They have put people on horses to pursue them with whips in their hands, with stocks and chains. They have built prisons. So much the hatred has grown of the foreign, of the strange. These, parcel, these prisons have even been built at sea so that these women and men cannot tread the earth of the white people who still believe themselves to be the superior race and are nostalgic for this. And through their choices and elections, they revive the leader who said so and who killed millions as a result. The exodus has increased over this year, showing how much the crisis of life is advancing. But the minutes are ticking on in defining life or death on our planet. And rather than halting this march of time and talking about how to defend life for the future, thanks to greater knowledge and expanding life to the universe, we are deciding instead to waste our time killing one another. We are not thinking about how to expand life to the stars but rather how to end life on our own planet. We have devoted ourselves to war. We have been called to war. Latin America has been called upon to produce war machines, men to go to the killing fields. They're forgetting that our countries have been invaded several times by the very same people who are now talking about combating invasions. They're forgetting that for oil, Iraq was invaded, Syria and Libya. They're forgetting that the same reasons they use to defend Zelensky are those very reasons which should be deployed to defend Palestine. They forget that to meet the sustainable development goals, all wars must be brought to an end. But they are helping to wage one war in particular because world powers see this suiting themselves in their gamesmanship, in their games of hunger, and they are forgetting to bring an end to the other war because for these powers, this, was not, this did not suit them. What is the difference between Ukraine and Palestine, I ask? Is it not time to bring an end to both wars and other wars too and make the most of the short time we have to build paths to save life on the planet? As president of Colombia, this country of beauty, 
de millones de obreros, of de mujeres the group del barrio of popular, humanity, millions of workers, negros, women and men from popular neighborhoods, indigenous people, Afro-descendants, people from the fields, workers, young people of all colors. I'm the president these people decided to elect in the majority, and I'm here to speak before you, and I propose bringing an end to this war so that we have time to save ourselves. I propose that the United Nations should hold, as soon as possible, two peace conferences, one on Ukraine, the other on Palestine. Not because there are no other wars in the world, as there are in my country, but because this would guide the way to making peace in all regions of the planet. Because both of these alone can bring an end to the hypocrisy as a political practice. Because we could be sincere, a virtue without which we cannot be warriors for life itself. The generation which today must decide and must act as soon as possible to overcome the enormous hurricane which has been unleashed against life from the dark but powerful forces of greed, the hurricane of capital which only looks to profit and which has swallowed up the planet and the very foundation of our existence. I propose bringing an end to war to defend life from the climate crisis, which is the mother of all crises. This summit has been established to evaluate the, tar the, yes, the targets of the Sustainable Development Goals established by the governments for 2013. It's easy to carry out an assessment. These human development goals will not be achieved. We are far from reaching them. We have moved backwards. The United Nations Human Development Objectives could more simply be called social and environmental justice. Social justice will not be achieved for humanity by 2030. Because what we have sown is injustice in our planet. What has been created over these years is injustice. The injustice of putting the vaccine against the deadly virus on the market, concentrating it in rich countries. Latin America saw 30% of COVID deaths, although it makes up only 8% of the world population. Who said that health should be a business and not a right? Millions of older people and others died because the vaccine was traded rather than being a common good of humanity. They failed to deliver on their own promise to finance adaptation to climate change. They do not have $100 billion to give to countries to defend themselves from floods, storms, and hurricanes. But they do have that money in a single day to allow Russians and Ukrainians to kill one another. Now we no longer need $100 billion. We need three trillion dollars to overcome the climate crisis and the clock is ticking. Ladies and gentlemen, injustice has been sown and cannabis growers and coca growers have been arrested rather than tackling the solitude in which the youth of their own countries live. These countries are the greatest economic and military power in the history of humanity. To combat this solitude, they have moved on to the drugs of death, to fentanyl. They wanted a war against the drugs of the rebellious youth who opposed the war in Vietnam, the marijuana and the LSD of the hippies, and they ended up driving their society towards the drug of neoliberalism and competition, the drug of the Manhattan yuppie, cocaine. And they imprisoned millions of Africans and Latin Americans in cold, private prisons. And a million Latin Americans 
were killed. Democracies were destroyed in our America. But they never arrested the Manhattan yuppie. And now they are facing the grand outcome of the prohibition of drugs, fentanyl, which, has no long, which is not killing 4,000, but 100,000 young people every year in the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, they sowed injustice. And the worst of these has been to condemn humanity to war. So today, the balance of social justice across the world is so skewed. The problem is that this was not an issue of socialists or progressives. Rather, it was a matter where the time left to the planet was flowing away. As president of the country of beauty, I propose returning to a time of simplicity to recover the time lost. So ending the war and reforming the global financial system. From the conferences, the peace conferences on Ukraine and Palestine, we should come out in a, able to build a reform that we have already discussed in the Amazon forest, where the greatest river of the earth, which has crossed the greatest jungle of the earth, reaches the sea. We had discussed this in Brasilia, and we went to Kenya to meet with the brotherly peoples of Africa, where we came from at the time of one of the other great injustices of power, slavery. And we went to Paris to see whether multitudes there were still crying for liberty, liberty equality, and fraternity. And we went to Washington to talk to the president and see whether we in the north and the south of the Americas could meet again, as we did in the past, over two centuries ago, where we met in history to talk about liberty, equality, democracy and republic. And let us talk in all possible ways about getting to the root of the climate crisis and its solution. If fossil capitalism has no financing, it will die. Its death throes will be hard, but this is necessary for there to be humanity, nature, and life. The decarbonized capitalism will have to be financed, but we know that green capital will only flow to places where there is profit. That is what governs it. And its structure is a very narrow one to contain the decarbonization of the entire world. Governments and powers who still believe that the climate crisis and that of life can be overcome with cheap loans are mistaken. They are deluded to propose that those countries of the earth which are already indebted are indebted as a result of disease and greed, and that they can use more loans to overcome a problem that only the belching chimneys of the north have produced. It is not possible to overcome the crisis of life, this mega-crisis, with more indebtedness. The financing of life, the flow of medicines, which must be pumped into the veins of the economies and societies of the world to meet the challenge of leaving behind coal and oil under the earth, leaving it under the earth in those very places where the true veins of the earth flow, as Roberto Cobaria, the Ua indigenous native from Colombia, said over 30 years ago. As he said, extracting oil was to remove the blood from the earth and life would then die. The majority of the investment to decarbonize the world's economy should come from public funds, the efforts of societies, bringing together states so as to bring together humanity. Today they call this multilateralism. Governing the earth with the vision of democracy and not a vision of empire. Empires do not save life. They merely unleash wars. If the mega-crisis of life is to be resolved, it will be through a democracy which achieves global, a global scale, a deeper democracy, which will not fear interlinking states and societies and planning for the great Marshall Plan of the revitalization of the planet.
The market will help us somewhat, but we cannot ask for solutions from a mechanism which, is, which has no humanity, and when it was this mechanism which produced the very problem. Private funds can be used, but they will be limited by their own, their own logic. The force to do this will come from public funds, and these funds are currently weakened by debt. The great battle of our generation is defending life for our children and grandchildren, and this can only be fully financed by what is public, by what belongs to all of us. We must liberate the public to save life. Many people may not like this, but if the voice of the public, of the state, of humanity, of multilateralism is to be heard again, this means the voice of change will be heard again, because in order to save life, this is fundamental. Saving life requires an epoch of change, and it is urgent. Change and life are now synonymous. Youth of all colors today, in order to live, must fly the flags of change, of transformation, of a new humanity. It is democracy and not authoritarian regimes which is looking more and more like the Nazis. It is global democracy. These plans, the power of those states who are not tackling war, but are tackling and attacking the plans for life. These plans to achieve the transition to a decarbonized economy and to finance it. The decarbonized economy will, without a doubt, be a more humane and a more just economy. So, I, as president of the country of beauty, propose a reform of the global financial system, of the IMF, of the multilateral bank, and bringing an end to economic blockades and guiding funds from private capital. If everybody's debt is reduced, paying off the creditors with an IMF issuance of special drawing rights, there will be a decrease in the global public debt and a real increase in budgets and public funds. In this way, we will be able to finance the Marshall Plan for the Sustainable Development Goals for the social and environmental justice of the planet, the plan to overcome, through mitigation and adaptation, the climate crisis, which is the crisis of life. This is reviving Keynes worldwide after forgetting him. This wise old man already said this, as did other wise people before him, and their words, too, are forgotten, the words that they express from their deep ideas. What a beautiful perspective in the midst of today's darkness and storms, a perspective which looks hopeful. The objective of life and justice can be achieved by treading the path of global democracy and of returning value to what is public, to what is common and shared which can be reached by all. I want my grandchildren, who are babies today, Luna, Victoria, and Luca, and my daughter Antonella, to be able to live far from the apocalypse and the era of extinction. I want them to live in times where humanity was able to stop killing itself and killing the planet and through the very diversity of its cultures, managed to achieve understanding and to achieve its mission, spreading the virus of life to the stars of the universe. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Colombia for the statement just made and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Majesty King Abdullah II, Ibn al Hussein II, King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. I request protocol 
to escort His Majesty. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Majesty King Abdullah II, Ibn al Hussein, King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Bismillah ar Rahman Rahim, Mr. President, Secretary General, Excellencies. When human catastrophes seem beyond description, we turn to the appalling statistics. This year, around the world, more than 345 million people face food insecurity, daily hunger, or starvation. Among the most vulnerable are 108 million refugees, people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes and ways of life. And 40% of these refugees are children the most defenseless of all. Yet these numbers cannot really convey the tragedy or the failure. Refugees are our brothers, our sisters. They look to our countries to help end the crises that have driven them from home. Refugees are mothers, fathers, grandparents who have made perilous journeys to save their families. They are young people with big dreams and little children who deserve the chance to dream big. They depend on the international community for their survival. And multiple UN agencies provide vital services to help meet the need. But in recent months, one by one, these agencies have been delivering difficult news. A severe shortfall in international funds has forced them to cut support. Is this what we've come to? Is the international community going to watch as refugee families find themselves forced to send their children to work instead of school? In Jordan, where refugees make up over one-third of our 11 million population, cuts have already thrown the lives of hundreds of thousands of refugees into uncertainty. The impact of such humanitarian shortfalls is never limited to a country or a region. Fear and want bring on sharp increases in the number of refugees fleeing to Europe and beyond on journeys that too often end in tragedy. My friends, Jordanians are serious about our duty to those in need. We have done everything we can to secure a dignified life for refugees. Nearly half of the almost 1.4 million Syrians we host are under 18 years of age. For many of them, Jordan is the only place they have ever known. Over 230,000 Syrian children have been born in Jordan since 2011. We are sharing precious resources to help them meet basic needs, food, energy, and especially water. We are among the water poorest countries in the world, even as our water supplies face extraordinary demand. And we face these pressures just when another crisis has hit our region. Climate change, with its destructive heat waves, drought, and flooding. And to meet the refugee burden, we have been carefully managing to combine our limited resources with essential support from the international community because the responsibility to act falls on everybody's shoulders, because the world cannot afford to walk away and leave a lost generation behind. But today, Jordan's capacity to deliver necessary services 
to refugees has surpassed our limits. Syrian refugees' future is in their country, not in host countries. But until they are able to return, we must all do right by them. And the fact is, refugees are far from returning. On the contrary, more Syrians are likely to leave their country as the crisis persists. And Jordan will not have the ability, nor the resources, to host and care for more. We must find a political solution consistent with UN Security Council Resolution 2254, the step-for-step -step approach that offers a path forward, proposed by Jordan as the basis for engagement with the Syrian government and coordinated with the UN. This approach sets a roadmap to incrementally resolve the crisis and deal with all its consequences. Until then, we will protect our country against any future threats the crisis could pose to our national security. My friends, Jordan's case is a microcosm of our entire region. For all our people's immense potential, repeated crises have held back the promise of greater development and prosperity. Our region is a focal point where some of the most urgent global challenges are converging. How will our world respond? Will we come together in global solidarity to get to the root of the problem, the conflicts and the crises that destroy life and hope? Will we work as one to rebuild the lost trust in international action and help those in want. My friends, our region will continue to suffer until the world helps lift the shadow of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the central issue in the Middle East. No architecture for regional security and development can stand over the burning ashes of this conflict. But seven and a half decades on, it still smolders. Where are we going? Without clarity on where Palestinians' future lies, it will be impossible to converge on a political solution to this conflict. Five million Palestinians live under occupation. No civil rights, no freedoms of mobility, no say in their lives. Yet every UN resolution since the beginning of this conflict recognizes the equal rights of the Palestinian people to a future of peace, dignity, and hope. This is the and prosperity. And delaying justice and peace has brought endless cycles of violence. 2023 has been the deadliest for the Palestinian people in the past 15 years. How can people trust in global justice while settlement building, land confiscations, and home demolitions continue? Where is the global solidarity to make UN resolutions believable by people in need of our help. Jerusalem is a flashpoint for global concern. Under the Hashemite custodianship of Islamic and Christian holy sites, Jordan remains committed to safeguarding the city's identity. But preserving Jerusalem as the city of faith and peace for Islam, Christianity, and Judaism is a responsibility that we all share. And we must not abandon Palestinian refugees to the forces of despair. Sustainable funding is urgently needed by UNRWA, the UN agency that provides vital relief, education, and health services to millions of Palestinian refugees. And this is essential 
to protect families, keep communities stable, and prepare young people for productive lives. We must protect young Palestinians from extremists who prey on their frustrations and hopelessness by making sure they continue to learn at the schools under the blue flag of the United Nations as the alternative will be the black flags of terror, hate, and extremism. My friends, we come together here as partners to deal with our challenges and shape a better future. We speak here for our people. We speak for families and the younger generations. We speak for victims of conflict, displacement, hunger, climate challenge, disasters, and more. They are not mere statistics. They are our fellow human beings sharing our world. Only by restoring trust, only by acting in solidarity, will we create the future all our peoples desire and deserve. We cannot allow for a lost generation on our watch. Thank you. I wish to thank the King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Majesty. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Andrzej Duda, President of the Republic of Poland. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. Good morning, Your Excellency. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Andrzej Duda. President of the Republic of Poland and invite him to address the Assembly. Distinguished Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, Honorable Delegates, I wish to congratulate His Excellency Mr. Dennis Francis on his election to the honorable function of the President of the 78th United Nations General Assembly. I wish to express Poland's full support for his mission and wish him every success in its fulfillment. At the same time, my thanks go out to His Excellency Chaba Koroshi in recognition of his active engagement while presiding over the work of the 77th session of the General Assembly. Sir President, ladies and gentlemen, 193 countries from every continent have gathered in New York at UN headquarters to discuss the most important threats and challenges facing the world today. The United Nations General Assembly is an extremely important event. It is the only place and the only opportunity to debate in our midst the crucial problems that affect us all. We are here because of the courageous and forward-looking decisions made by the leaders of the Western world during the darkest days of the Second World War. At that time, they pondered over how to avoid seminal tragedies in the future. The leaders of the United States and Great Britain, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill, and soon the other countries of the anti-Hitler coalition including Poland, signed the Atlantic Charter. It contained the most important principles on which the post-war world order was to be based, save the determination of nations, inviolability of borders, 
renunciation of violence, economic cooperation, human rights. The Atlantic Charter, together with the Washington Declaration, were the cornerstone in a building of the United Nations organization. Ladies and gentlemen, today once again, it befell on us to live in dangerous times. As a result of Russia's full-scale aggression on Ukraine, hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives or suffered injuries. Millions were forced to flee their own home country and hundreds of millions worldwide are facing the specter of famine and serious economic disruption. Russia's brutal aggression brought immense global problems in its aftermath. It put to a test international world order. Costs of those barbarian actions, humanitarian, material, and environmental, are incalculable and still growing. For long, world peace has never been as threatened as it is today. We, Poles, know fully well that peace is not to be taken for granted. September in the history of my home country is a special month. On 1st September 1939, Nazi Germany invited my homeland, Poland. The Second World War broke out. On 17th September 1939, we received a blow from another direction. The Soviet Union also made an onslaught on Poland. In the wake of the alliance between Hitler and Stalin, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, Poland lost its independence was wiped out from the map of the world and subjected to extremely brutal occupation. This is precisely why we understand the tragedy of Ukraine better than any other country in the world and the tragedy of other countries experiencing the pandemonium of war. In the Second World War, six million of our citizens perished, including three million Polish Jews. And Warsaw, the capital of Poland, was razed to the ground. And yet our history stands as a testament that even crimes and persecution are not able to suppress the true spirit of freedom, that freedom will finally prevail. Enslavement, imperialism, and neocolonialism are a denial of freedom as much as insane dreams of dominating the others. When unleashing the war in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin wanted to restore the Russian Empire, to divide the world and to make Europe systematically dependent on his raw materials. He has not succeeded. It is my firm belief that he will no longer succeed. Ladies, and gentlemen, today the world needs courageous and visionary leaders. The late president of Poland, Lech Kaczynski, with whom I had the honor to cooperate, was such a leader. The leader who a dozen of years ago was trying to shake the conscience to appeal to politicians to warn of imperial policy of Vladimir Putin's Russia. Let me recall at this point his seminal words said in Tbilisi at the height of Russian aggression on Georgia in 2008. For the first time in a long time, Russians have shown the face we have known for hundreds of years. They believe that the nations around them should be subjected to them. We say no. Russia believes that the old days of the empire that collapsed less than 20 years ago are coming back. That domination will again be feature of our region. Well, it will not. Those days are over once and for all. Yes, 
Today, in this very place, at the United Nations headquarters, I wish to reiterate, those days can never return. The logic of conquest, changing borders by force, disregarding the law, and denying the Ukrainian people their right to exist must be stopped. This brutal, brutal war must end and not be converted into a frozen war. This can only be done, be done by restoring the full territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Ladies and gentlemen, Poland's position in the face of any war is clear and straightforward. We demand absolute respect for internationally recognized national borders. The inviolability of these borders is a fundamental element of the world order. Today, the victim is Ukraine. Tomorrow, it could be any one of us if we do not follow these ironclad rules if we do not insistently enforce compliance with international law. Forgotten and unpunished war crimes, crimes against humanity, build a sense of impunity among the perpetrators. Such crimes give permission to their successors and imitators who, following suit, commit similar crimes when they want to dominate and determine the fate of other states and nations. The crimes in a war in Ukraine are the living proof thereof. That is why we are engaged in initiative to hold Russia accountable for gross violations of fundamental norms of international law. We strongly support the work of the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. We support the work of the Independent International Commission under the UN Human Rights Council to investigate the violation of human rights and humanitarian law in the context of Russian aggression and to collect, verify, and preserve evidence. We support the idea of establishing an ad hoc special tribunal the crimes must be accounted for and the perpetrators punished. Ladies and gentlemen, information wherefore goes on. Lie is used to cover up and justify Russian crimes on civilian population. Russia continually tries to shape international public opinion by building a false vision of the reality. In Poland, this comes as no surprise to us, but the world is just about to discover the scale of manipulation and disinformation. This spearhead is often direct, directed also at my country, Poland, libeled in many various ways. This is because we have consistently been opposing Russia's imperial and neo-colonial policy and have supported Ukraine in its defense from the outset. We, as international community, must draw conclusions from the situation. We must confront manipulation and disinformation. We must fight against the hypocrisy of history, the reversal of the roles of the henchman and a victim. What is evil should be called evil. A crime should be called a crime. Ladies and gentlemen, these days many states are blamed for prolonging the war as they supply necessary weapons to Ukraine in its defense war. This is a completely false logic, as if putting the blame on a neighbor who comes to aid to the people next door defending their own home against mugger. If someone attacks your household, you have the right to defend it and the neighbors should not to stay indifferent. Ukraine would not be able to resist the aggression and effectively stand for its independence if it were not for, an, for the assistance of other countries 
and primarily on the biggest scale, the United States of America. It is the United States that has been playing pivotal role in assuring security in Europe for more than a century. I'm saying so as a president of the European country, which was plagued by war experience on so many occasions. It must be remembered that the engagement of the United States in the First World War led it to an end as much as to the restoration of independence by Poland and by other countries of the Central and Eastern Europe. The United States played a pivotal role in defeating Nazi Germany. Without the U.S. support, neither the United Kingdom nor the Soviet Union would have been able to resist Hitler. Finally, the United States was instrumental in the reconstruction of Western Europe in the aftermath of war and in fending off the threat posed by the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War. It is too often that Europe tends to forget that it owes this, its security and prosperity to the U.S. commitment and presence. In Poland, we recall this very well. That is why Poland's top priority for the time of our presidency of the European Union in the first half of 2025 will be enhancing transatlantic relations and cooperation between the EU and the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, Poland has never had colonies, the fact of which we are proud. We emphasize it on all occasions. Instead, my home country was many times brutally attacked, destroyed, and used by the neighbors with their imperial ambitions. For 123 years, Poland disappeared from the maps of the world. That is why we understand very well the countries that suffered colonialism and the challenges they need to confront. Wherever the international community is in need, Poland is always ready to respond to the call and without any hesitation. We provide assistance in many corners of the world. Despite the war in the immediate neighborhood, we will continue our support to the Eastern partnership countries. We continue to focus on countries of the sub-Saharan region. We are present in the Middle East. Given the refugee crisis caused by the war in Syria, Poland's assistance to Iraq Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan will be maintained. Poland will also continue its humanitarian support. Many places around the world are facing worsening food crisis. The situation is most difficult in Africa, where one in five people is suffering from hunger. Also, the population suffering hunger is increasing in West Asia, and the Caribbean. To die, today, an estimated 2.4 billion people lack sustainable regular access to food, of which some 900 million face severe food insecurity. Therefore, in 2022, we in Poland have supported the World Food Fund activities in Africa the Middle East and Asia, including Lebanon, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, and Syria. We found our activities mainly through multilateral channels, as well as through Polish NGOs and their local partners. Poland fully recognizes the ambitions of the African Union to play an even more active role in the global on the global stage. Ensuring peace and development in Africa will be facilitated by good and cost-effective governance and the development of democracy on the continent. We respect African solutions 
to African problems, standing ready to share the experience we have gained in the difficult but successful transformation of our economy. Ladies and gentlemen, Poland is a country of freedom and solidarity. It is known worldwide for the great solidarity movement which not only stood for workers' rights, but also for freedom and fundamental values. The movement which brought together millions of people courageously defied an evil and changed the course of modern history, bringing about the fall of communism. We are extremely proud of our solidarity. Upon Russian aggression on Ukraine, the Poles have once again illustrated that solidarity is not only the great history, but that solidarity lives in us. Millions of my compatriots committed themselves to bring aid to the people fleeing the nightmare of war. In the very first days of the war, many journalists were coming to Poland and invariably asked me, where are the refugee camps? And my response was, there are not any. There are not. There was no talk about camps. We hosted our guests in our own homes. We also had the honor of hosting many world leaders who came bringing humanitarian aid, including the United Nations Secretary General and other United Nations high-ranking officials. Thank you for your support and for your presence. Greater solidarity must come as a response to the evil, the war, and aggression. Without solidarity, there will be no lasting peace. Ladies and gentlemen, the world today needs more solidarity. We believe that the idea of solidarity-based development, which we hold so dear, is a beacon for security and prosperity. Poland is ready to take on concrete measures to support the United Nations operation undertaken to confront the most fundamental global challenges and threats, social and economic crisis. We wish to support the idea of just transition of economic and social changes that will not lose sight of the human dimension so that nobody is left behind. We believe that our experience as a leader of Central Europe, the fifth economy in European Union, and the largest state in a treaties initiative can prove valuable and many countries which vary in degrees of economic and social development. We are ready to share with our partners from around the world not only our experience in the process of economic transformation, but also specific technologies that many Polish companies have available. Poland is proud to have been elected as a member of the United Nations Economic and Social Council for the 2024-2026 term. A key priority for our ECOSOC membership will be to draw the international community's attention to the impact of global crises, such as armed conflicts, the energy crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, and climate change, their impact on socio-economic development. Time is running out to achieve the goals of the 2030 Agenda, and the Sustainable Development Goals. And there are still many challenges ahead, so we must unite and intensify our efforts to accelerate the implementation of the individual tasks. Ladies and gentlemen, today the United Nations measures its strength against various challenges the decision-making impasse in Security Council, the situation in which Russia, one of the permanent members of the Council, is deliberately violated 
violating the UN Charter. The lengthy debates are considered a symptom of the weakness of both the organization and its constituent states. There are some people who ask questions about whether the UN is needed at all. Does it fit the times? On behalf of Poland, a neighbor of attacked Ukraine, a country that has taken in millions of refugees, I emphatically answer, yes, the United Nations is very much needed. No better system for international cooperation has been invented. The United Nations best justifies its experience not here in the New York or Geneva, but by bringing aid and assistance to those most in need, children, victims of war, the persecuted and the hungry, every day, all over the world. In 2025, the UN will celebrate 80th years of its ex existence. We remember why it was founded. Today, in these dangerous times, we need a return to the thinking and actions of the founding fathers of the United Nations. There will be no lasting peace without cooperation, without solidarity between richer and poorer countries, and ultimately without respect for international law. Poland wants cooperation. Poland wants solidarity. Poland wants peace. Thank you very much for your attention. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Poland for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort his escorts. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Miguel Diaz Canel Bermudez, President of the Republic of Cuba. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Miguel Diaz Canel. President, I am bringing to this Assembly the voice of the South, the exploited and humiliated, as was said by Che Guevara in this same room almost 60 years ago. We are a diverse group of nations sharing the same problems. We have just confirmed that in Havana, which was honored to host the Summit of Leaders and other high representatives of the G77 in China, which is the most representative, broad and diverse representation that exists in the multilateral arena. During those two vilest, virtually tireless days, more than 100 representatives from 134 nations making up the group raised their voices to call for changes that can no longer be postponed in the midst of this unjust, irrational and abusive international economic order that year after year has deepened the enormous inequality between a minority of well-developed nations and a majority that has not managed to get rid of the euphemism of developing nations. Worse still, as was recognized by the United Nations Secretary General at the Havana Summit, the G77 was founded six decades ago to repair centuries of injustice and abandonment. And in today's convulsive world, they are entangled in a host of world crises where poverty is on the rise and hunger is even greater. We are united by the need to change, which has not been resolved, and by the condition of being the main victims of the current global multidimensional crisis, abusive unequal exchange, scientific and technological gaps, and the degradation of the environment. But we are also united and have been for more than half a century now by the inescapable challenge and the determination to transform the current international order, which, as well as being exclusionary and irrational, is unsustainable for the planet.
and is not viable for the well-being of all. The countries represented at the G77 and China, where more than 80% of the population lives, are do not only have the challenge of development, they also have the responsibility of modifying those structures which marginalize us from social progress and turn many peoples of the South into laboratories for new renewed forms of domination. A new and more just global contract is imperative. President, only seven years ahead of the deadline established to implement the promising 2030 agenda, the panorama is bleak. This august institution has already recognized it. At the current pace, none of the 17 SDGs will be achieved, and over half of the 169 agreed targets will not be met. In the midst of the 21st century, the fact that almost 800 million people suffer from hunger in a planet that produces enough to feed all is outrageous. Equally outrageous is the fact that in the era of knowledge and accelerated development of ICTs, more than 760 million people, two-thirds of them women, do not know how to read or write. The efforts of developing countries are not enough to implement the 2030 Agenda. They must be supported by concrete actions to provide access to markets, financing under fair and preferential conditions, technology transfer and north-south cooperation. We are not begging for alms or asking for favours. The G77 calls for rights and will continue to demand a profound transformation of the current international financial architecture because it is deeply unjust, anachronistic and dysfunctional because it was designed to profit with the reserves of the South to perpetuate a system of domination that increases underdevelopment and replicates a pattern of modern colonialism. We need and demand financial institutions in which our countries have true decision-making capacity and access to financing. A recapitalization of multilateral development banks is imperative to radically improve their lending conditions and to meet the financial needs of the South. The member countries of this group were forced to allocate $379 billion from their reserves to protect their currencies in 2022, almost twice as much the amount of special drawing rights allocated by, to them by the IMF. A rationalization, review and change of role of credit qualifying agencies is needed. Equally imperative is to establish criteria that would go beyond the GDP to define the access of developing countries to financing under favorable conditions and with adequate technical cooperation. While the richest countries fail to meet the commitment of allocating at least 0.7% of their, uh, national, uh, their GDP to official assistance for development, the nations of the South need to spend up to 14% of their incomes to pay the interests associated with external debt. Most of the G77 nations are forced to allocate more resources to servicing debt than to investments in health or education. What sustainable development can be achieved with that noose around their necks? The group today reiterates its call to public, multilateral and private creditors to refinance the debt through credit guarantees, lower interest and longer expiration deadlines. We insist on the implementation of a multilateral mechanism to reschedule the sovereign debt with an effective participation of the countries of the South that will allow for a fair, balanced and development-oriented treatment. It is imperative to redesign once and for all the debt instruments and to include activation provisions to alleviate and reschedule as soon as a country becomes affected by natural catastrophes and problems problems that are microeconomic problems that are so common amongst the vulnerable nations.
President, no one in their right mind is denying now that climate change threatens the survival of all with irreversible effects. It is also a secret to no one that those who are least responsible for climate change are those who are suffering the most from its effects, particularly small island development state, developing states. Industrialized countries, meanwhile, are the voracious predators of resources and of the environment, but they elude their greatest responsibility and fail to comply with their commitments and uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. Just to mention one example, it is profoundly disappointing that the goal of mobilizing no less than $100 billion a year up to 2020 as climate financing has never been met. On the eve of the 28th COP, the G77 countries will have as a priority the exercise of the global balance, the implementation of the loss and damage fund, the definition of the framework for the adaptation goal, and the establishment of the new climate financing goal, which fully abides by the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. The G77 is convening a summit of leaders of the South to be held on the 2nd of December in the context of COP28 in Dubai. This initiative is unprecedented in the context of a conference of the parties and will be a forum to articulate positions within our group at the highest level in the context of climate negotiations. COP28 will show whether or not, beyond speeches, there is a real political will on the part of developed nations to achieve the agreement, agreements required in this field that cannot be postponed for any longer. President, for the G77, the priority is to change once and for all the paradigms of science, technology and innovation, which is limited to the environment and perspectives of the North, thus depriving the international scientific community of a considerable intellectual capital. The successful Havana summit launched an urgent appeal to concentrate science, technology and innovation around the sustainable development goals. There, we decided to resume the work of the Consortium of Science, Technology and Innovation for the South with the purpose of promoting joint research projects and promoting the joining up of production systems so that they could reduce their dependence on the markets of the North. We also agreed to promote a call for convening in 2025 a high-level meeting of the United Nations General Assembly on Science, Technology and Innovation for Development. The 17 cooperation projects that Cuba has designed in the context of its chairmanship of the G77 will contribute to channeling the potentials of South-South and triangular cooperation. We call on the richest nations and on international bodies to participate in these initiatives. Cuba will not falter in its efforts to promote the creative potential influence and leadership of the G77. Our group has a lot to contribute to multilateralism, stability, justice and the rationality that the world requires today. Excellencies, added to the problems and challenges characterizing the reality of our nations and mobilizing peoples are the unilateral coercive measures, euphemistically called sanctions, which have become a practice of powerful states that intend to act as universal judges and to weaken and destroy economies and isolate and subject sovereign states. Cuba is not the first sovereign state against which measures of that sort are applied, but it is the one being subjected to them for the longest period of time, despite world condemnation, which is expressed almost unanimously every year in this assembly, but which is disrespected and un goes unheard by the government of the biggest economic, financial and military power in the world. We were not the first, and we are not the last. Pressures to isolate and weaken economies and sovereign states are also today affecting Venezuela, Nicaragua, and both before and after these have been the prelude to inv invasions and the overthrowing of uncomfortable governments in the Middle East. We reject unilateral coercive measures 
in countries such as Zimbabwe, Syria, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and Iran, amongst many other countries whose people have been suffering from the negative impacts of these measures. We reiterate our solidarity with the Palestinian cause and support the right to self-determination of the Sahrawi people. Let us all struggle for a world of peace without wars or conflicts. Five years ago, I spoke for the first time from this rostrum that had been taken before by the historical leader of the Cuban Revolution, Commander-in-Chief Fidel Castro Ruz and Army General Raul Castro Ruz, to speak these truths and to speak the ideals of peace and justice of a small archipelago that has resisted and will continue to resist to live up to the dignity, courage and unbreakable strength of its people and history. But I cannot stand at this global tribune without denouncing once again the fact that for 60 years now, Cuba is suffering from an asphyxiating economic blockade designed to depress its income and living standards, to promote a continued scarcity of food, medicines and other basic inputs, and to damage its development potential. That is the nature and those are the objectives of the economic coercion and the great pressure applied by the United States government against Cuba in violation of international law and the UN Charter. Cuba has not implemented a single measure or action aimed at damaging the United States or its economic sector or its trade or social fabric. Cuba has not engaged in any action threatening the United States' independence, harming their sovereign rights, interfering in its internal affairs or affecting the well-being of its people. The United States' behavior is absolutely unilateral and unjustified. The Cuban people is resisting and overcoming isolation day after day creatively against this merciless, merciless economic warfare, which since 2019, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, was opportunistically escalated to an extreme, cruel and inhumane dimension. The effects are brutal. The United States government is pressuring entities for them not to provide the oxygen of medicine which are needed in Cuba to face the pandemic. Our Cuban scientists created vaccines and developed the ventilators which were needed to save the country and which we put at the disposal of other countries of the world as well. With surgical and vicious precision, they calculated both in Washington and Florida how to inflict the greatest possible damage to Cuban families. The United States continues its actions and has tried to prevent the supply of fuel and lubricants to our country, which would be unthinkable in times of peace. In a globalized world, it is not only absurd but criminal to prohibit access to technologies, including medical equipment, which have over 10% of United States components. It is shameful their action against the medical cooperation provided by Cuba to numerous nations. It even goes so far as to openly threaten sovereign governments for requesting this contribution and meeting the needs for public health amongst their populations. The United States is depriving its citizens of the right to travel to Cuba, defying its own constitution. The intensification of the blockade has an impact on migratory flows in our country over the last few years, which means a painful cost for Cuban families and has demographic and economic consequences of an adverse nature for the nation. The government of the United States lies and causes great harm to international efforts to combat terrorism when it accuses Cuba in an utterly baseless way of being a sponsor of this scourge. Under the shield of this arbitrary and fraudulent accusation, they extort hundreds of banking and financial entities throughout the world and force them to choose between continuing their relations with the United States or maintaining their links with Cuba. 
Our country is truly under siege. It's suffering from a cruel, silent, extraterritorial economic war. This is accompanied by a powerful political machinery for destabilization, with vast funds approved by the United States Congress, with the aim of capitalizing on the shortfalls caused by the blockade and undermining the constitutional order of the country and its people's serenity. Despite the hostility of its government, of this government, we will continue to build bridges with the people of the United States, as we do with all peoples of the world. We will strengthen still further the links with Cuban immigrates, immigrants in any part of the world. President, promoting and protecting human rights is a shared ideal which requires a genuine spirit of respect and constructive dialogue between states. Regrettably, 75 years since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, reality is very different from this. This has become a political weapon for powerful nations who seek to force their geopolitical designs upon independent nations, mainly those from the South. No country is immune from challenges, and none has the authority to consider itself an example in terms of human rights and to stigmatize other models, cultures, or sovereign states. We defend dialogue and cooperation as effective ways to promote and protect human rights without any politicization or selectivity, without applying double standards, conditions, or pressure. In this spirit, Cuba has pre presented its candidature to the Human Rights Council for 2024 to 2026 in the elections which will take place on the 10th of October. We are grateful in advance for the trust of those countries which have already provided their valuable support. If we are elected, the voice of Cuba will continue to stand up for a universal vision, as seen from the South, of the inter legitimate interests of developing countries, including constructive commitment and the unavoidable responsibility to the full achievement of all human rights for all. Cuba will continue to bolster its democracy and its socialist model, which, although it is buffeted, has shown what a developing country can do, even if it is small in size and with scant natural resources. We will continue our transformative efforts to seek exits from the siege which is imposed upon us by the United States imperialism and ways to achieve the prosperity with social justice that our people deserve. In this endeavor, we will never renounce the right to defend ourselves. President, distinguished heads of delegation and other representatives, I conclude by extending an invitation to all of you to work to overcome differences and to address shared challenges urgently. To do this, the United Nations and this General Assembly, including with all their limitations, are the most powerful instrument that we have. You can always count upon Cuba to defend multilateralism and to, together to promote peace and sustainable development for all. It will always be an honor to fight for justice, sharing the difficulties and challenges with the peoples of the South who are ready to change history. We will prevail. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Cuba for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Recep Tayyip Erdogan, President of the Republic of Turkey. I request protocol to escort His Excellency.
On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Recep Tayyip Erdogan, President of the Republic of Turkey, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Distinguished President, distinguished heads of states and governments, distinguished Secretary General, valuable delegates, I would like to salute you all with my most heartfelt emotions on behalf of myself and on behalf of the Turkish nation. I would like to congratulate Mr. Kerosi, who successfully completed his term as President of the 77th General Assembly of the United Nations, and wish all the success to Mr. Francis, who is taking over his duty. I hope that the 78th General Assembly, convened with a team of trust and solidarity, will be a blessing for the entire human race. Unfortunately, it's not possible to draw a more optimistic picture of the future of our world compared to the assessments we had carried out over this podium here last year. The picture before us shows that we're facing increasingly complex and dangerous challenges on a global scale. There are conflicts, wars, humanitarian crises, political strife, and social tensions to the south, north, east, and west of my own country. These growing challenges, compounded by global economic problems, are becoming more and more to difficult more difficult to deal with. In addition to the humanitarian tragedy, the war on Europe's eastern borders has created serious problems in all areas, from economy to security, from energy to food supply security. Terrorism, which is used as an instrument of proxy wars in Syria, North Africa and the Sahel region, is causing irreparable damage to the increasingly fragile international security climate. The areas of operation of terrorist organizations, which grow by exploiting the ambitions of global powers, are spreading like an epidemic across vast geographies, taking advantage of technological developments and deteriorating socio-economic conditions everywhere. The signs of xenophobia, racism, and Islamophobia turning into a new crisis have reached alarming levels in the last one year. No matter which corner of the world we shall live in, climate change and related natural disasters have become a reality in our daily lives and of our daily lives. On the morning of February the 6th, 2023, Turkey faced, in the words of the Secretary General, quote, one of the biggest natural disasters of the century, both in terms of its magnitude and the area it affected. It's impossible for us to forget the sincerity of the international community, including that of the United Nations, in responding urgently to our appeal for help, the help, the self-sacrificing efforts, and the generous support provided to our country. The friendship shown to our country on this very dark day, when more than 50,000 people have lost their lives and 850,000 buildings were destroyed and cities sheltering millions of people for virtually leveled to the ground was an important source of consolation for us. <laughs> we have friends from all across the globe, from a hundred countries. I would like to thank you sincerely for the helping hand you have so generously extended to us. 
Our efforts are underway in an uninterrupted fashion in order to reconstruct our destroyed cities and the buildings in there. And a few days ago, Libya, with which we have strong historical ties, was subjected to heavy destruction and significant loss of life caused by storms and floods. Following the disaster, Turkey immediately mobilized to help Libya, where 12,000 people have lost their lives and thousands are still unaccounted for. Within the first phase, we've sent three vessels and three planes, along with 567 personnel, relief personnel, hundreds of vehicles and thousands of tons of food, shelter and sanitary supplies. Our non-governmental organizations are also participating in the relief efforts in that region with their own means and their capabilities. As a country that stands by the side of the victimized and oppressed people, wherever they might be in the world, we haven't and we will not leave our Libyan brothers and sisters alone. And the friendly countries hopefully will be mobilized in order to extend a helping hand uh, to Libya. And I would like to wish an expeditious recovery to our Moroccan brothers and sisters who were hit by a very strong earthquake just like the one we had recently experienced. Distinguished delegates, we are pleased to see that this year's theme of the General Assembly is in line with Turkey's goals, because our vision of the Turkey's century, which we started to realize in the 100th anniversary of our republic, is the most concrete expression of this overlapping vision, a vision that eliminates global injustices, addressing economic inequalities and producing peace, security, stability and prosperity effective, inclusive, that embraces humanity. In short, it's a call, it's our call for the establishment of an international system for the benefit of entire humanity. And this vision is finding more and more resonance. We agree with the Distinguished Secretary General, Mr. Guterres's recent observation, whereby he stated that the institutions established after the Second World War no longer reflect today's world. This statement expresses our call for the world is bigger than five. The Security Council has ceased to be the guarantor of world security and has become a battleground for the political strategies of only five countries. We consider the recent events taking place in Cyprus as a manifestation of this hollowed out institutional structure that doesn't inspire justice and trust anymore. As a country that has pioneered numerous initiatives to strengthen peace and stability, we attach great importance to Mr. Guterres's call for a new agenda for peace. With this understanding, since the beginning of the Russian-Ukrainian war, we have been endeavoring to keep both our Russian and Ukrainian friends around the table with a thesis that war will have no winners and peace will have no losers. We will step up our efforts to end the war through diplomacy and dialogue on the basis of Ukraine's independence and territorial integrity. With the Black Sea Initiative, which we have launched together with the United Nations, we have prevented the threat of a global hunger crisis by ensuring the delivery of 33 million tons of grain through the Black Sea to the global markets. However, the failure to implement this agreement in all its elements has left the world facing a new crisis. This initiative had been extended three times in part with my efforts. This 
humanitarian bridge that ex extends to the uh, countries that are in dire need will hopefully benefit from our arrangements and from our negotiations. We have a new plan uh, whereby another 1 million tons of grain will be released to the countries in dire need around the world. Our aim is to make the greatest possible contribution to the world peace and prosperity in the face of the conflicts around us. The humanitarian tragedy in Syria is now marking its 13th year, and it's worsening the living conditions of everyone in the region, regardless of their origin and their faith. We are the only country to take a principled, constructive and a fair stance against developments that threaten Syria's political unity, social integrity and economic well-being. It's becoming increasingly important to end the crisis in the South with a comprehensive, lasting and a sustainable solution which meets the legitimate expectations of the people. The devastating impact of the February 6th earthquakes, which affected 14 million people in our country, was also deeply felt in Syria. Especially in northwestern Syria, the already troubled humanitarian situation has only worsened. It's unfortunate that the United Nations cross-border humanitarian aid operations in the region was interrupted at such a time. As Turkey, we will not leave more than 4 million people struggling to survive in the north of Syria to their fate and demise. As the construction of the settlements we lead beyond our borders are completed, we will continue to encourage the return of the refugees in our country to these statements, to these settlements, excuse me. However, the biggest threat to Syria's territorial integrity and political unity is the support given to terrorist organizations guided by the powers that have designs on this country. The Syrian people are overwhelmed by the PKK PYD terrorist organizations and the radical groups organized on the basis of sectarian divisions and on the other hand, uh, different groups have reached the point where it is no longer unbearable for the people. As a matter of fact, various consequences of this have started to emerge recently. Iraq, another neighbor, is also making sincere efforts to overcome the internal and external challenges it faces. We act with an understanding that strengthens Iraq's political unity, territorial integrity and reconstruction efforts. And we do not discriminate between the constituent elements of the country. As the re countries of the region, the path to development will be established so that the regional integration will be ensured. The games of those who cling to the Daesh excuse every time they are in trouble in the region have now been all but exposed. As the leader of a country that has actually fought the biggest battle against Daesh, inflict, inflicted the biggest losses on this organization, and knows the realities in front of and behind the problem, I want to speak very clearly and frankly. We are sick and tired of the hypocrisy of those who use Daesh and similar organizations as a front to their own political and economic interests in the Middle East, North Africa and Sahel, but especially in Syria and Iraq. We're tired. The threat in these regions is not only confined to Daesh. The real threat is the terrorist organizations, paramilitary groups, mercenaries, and local elements that are used and that are being nurtured as tools of proxy wars. 
And whoever pays the highest price will use these uh, elements. Despite this reality, countries that continue to work with terrorist organizations for their own political and economic interests have no right to complain about terrorism and its problems as an extension. In such a world, no one is safe. Where, whether they live right next to a conflict zone or far away on the land surrounded by oceans. Nobody, nobody can be safe. That's why we say that under the auspices of the United Nations, we must rapidly restructure the institutions charged with ensuring the security, peace and prosperity of the world. We must build a global governance architecture that is capable of representing all origins, beliefs and cultures in the world with its geography and demographies. In conclusion, we say once again with all of our hearts, the world is bigger than five and a fairer world is possible. Distinguished delegates, I would now like to briefly share with you my country's approach to various problem areas, starting with our own region. The transformation of the eastern Mediterranean into a sovereign region of peace, prosperity and stability will only be possible if the rights and the law of all parties are respected. We have no eyes on anybody's rights, and we do not and will not allow anyone to ignore our rights. This is the 60th anniversary of the emergence of the Cyprus question. The Turkish Cypriot side has always made sincere efforts to find a just, lasting and sustainable solution to the Cyprus issue. It is a widely accepted fact that this solution can no longer be realized on the basis of the federation model. That's why we invite the international community to recognize the independence of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus and to establish diplomatic, political and economic ties with this country. We also expect the United Nations peacekeeping force on the island to observe meticulously the impartiality it is obliged to display. We do not want this already discredited, discredited force to face another loss of credibility in Cyprus. And we are making sincere efforts for uh, Yemen. We have strong historical ties with Yemen, and we hope and pray that this uh, problem will be settled once and for all through unquestionable respect to the territorial integrity and unity of Yemen. Our relations with Egypt used to be a little stagnant for a while, but we have recently entered an era where the relations are developing quite expeditiously, and our relations are growing on the basis of mutual uh, interests and benefits. It's very important to mention also that in order for peace to reign in the Middle East, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict should be brought to an eventual solution. We will continue to support the Palestinian people and, their, and state in their struggle for their legitimate rights under international law. If I need to repeat once again, without the realization of an independent and geographically integrated Palestinian state based on the 1967 borders, it is difficult for Israel to find the peace and security it seeks in that part of the world. In this context, we will continue to pursue respect for the historic status of Jerusalem, in particular uh, 
We have strong political, economic and humanitarian ties with the Balkans going back in history. And we are working hard on bilateral, regional and international platforms to ensure stability in this critical region of Europe and to resolve the disputes through dialogue. We actively support the processes excuse me, we actively support the process for the normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia, which have been strained recently. The increasingly complex nature of regional and global challenges points to the need for Turkey and European Union relations to move forward on a healthy basis more than ever before. We expect the European Union to quickly start fulfilling its long neglected obligations towards our country. Especially the ambiguous attitudes against Turkey should be stopped once and for all. Latin, Amer Latin America and the Caribbean is another region where we are mobilizing all elements of our humanitarian foreign policy and where our ties of friendship are getting stronger day by day. In the forthcoming period, we aim to transform these relations into a Turkey, Latin America and the Caribbean partnership policy. On the 60th anniversary of its establishment, the African Union is a monumental symbol of the continent taking its destiny into its own hands and standing up. The process that started with the will to find African solutions to African problems has turned into one of the most important developmental projects in the world. To accompany Africa on this path, we have crowned our ties of friendship with the continent with a strategic partnership. However, I must once again reiterate that we have welcomed the G20 membership of African Union, which we attach great significance to as well. It's a fact that the Sahel region faces serious political, economic, social and security challenges. We hope that Niger, which has been experiencing troubled times recently, will regain constitutional order and democratic governance as soon as possible. Any military intervention in Niger risks plunging, in this, plunging this country and the entire region into deeper instability. Our Asia Anew initiative has become a symbol of our will to further advance our relations with Asia, our ancestral homeland, on the basis of mutual benefit and common priorities. We have a historic opportunity to build peace, tranquility, cooperation in the South Caucasus to seize this opportunity fully we have launched a process with armenia aiming at good neighborly relations and a full normalization in the same spirit we have supported the negotiations between azerbaijan and armenia from the very beginning however Armenia is not taking the utmost opportunity of this historical uh, chance. We expect a comprehensive peace agreement to be signed between the two countries as soon as possible and promises to be quickly fulfilled, especially the opening of the Zangezur corridor. And Karabakh is the territory of Azerbaijan. Any other status imposed will never be accepted. 
Everybody has the right to coexist on the Azerbaijani soil, including the Armenians, and that should be our primary goal. There will be one, uh, we are moving together with Azerbaijan under the slogan, under the motto that we are two nations, one state. And the the efforts for the strengthening of our cooperation with the countries of the Central Asia, where the roots of our ancient civilization lie and where we share the same culture, are currently underway. We are pleased that the organization of Turkic states is becoming an increasingly effective regional and global actor. The Afghani people, who have been going through difficult times for half a century, are in dire need of humanitarian assistance and support, regardless of political motives. The transport transformation of the interim government into an inclusive administration in which all segments of society are fairly represented will pave the way for Afghanistan and will be positively received in the international arena. Another development that will pave the way for regional peace, stability and prosperity in South Asia will be the establishment of a just and lasting peace in Kashmir through dialogue and cooperation between India and Pakistan. As Turkey, we will continue to support the steps to be taken in this direction. We emphasize at every opportunity that we respect China's territorial integrity and uh, sovereignty. However, we will continue to express our sensitivity regarding the protection of the fundamental rights and freedoms of Uyghur Turks, with whom we have strong historical and humanitarian ties. We are a country that has extended a helping hand to Rohingya Muslims living in difficult conditions in Myanmar and Bangladesh since the first day. Our support for the displaced Rohingyas will continue until they are safe, voluntary, dignified and permanent return to their homeland is ensured. Dear delegates, our goal of continuously improving relations with our neighbors as well as with our friends in more distant geographies is essential manifestation of our quest to respond more effectively to global challenges. And energy supply security is an important issue in the global agenda and we have carried out significant investments in the last two decades in order to uh, depend on our own means. Energy will no longer, should no longer be used as an instrument of hostility, but energy should be a vessel for solidarity and cooperation. So within this framework, from the Black Sea to the Balkans, from the uh, Caucasia to uh, many different parts of the world, we have uh, always prioritized cooperation and solidarity. And we are striving to do more. And in the field of transportation, Turkey has the geopolitical position to support all projects that will pass through or around it. Technological innovations should be seen as an opportunity to solve global and regional challenges, not as a trump card to increase competitiveness. Unfortunately, we are gradually moving away from the slogan Zero Hunger by 2030, which is among the most important titles of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In fact, we find it difficult to accept hunger as an issue, as an unsolved problem here in the 21st century. We call on all countries to show strong will to realize the sustainable developmental goals, especially in this region where wealth has skyrocketed, and we cannot explain 
I, 735 million inhabitants of the world, still live in dire poverty. Hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent in order to reach space, but from Africa to uh, Asia, millions of people cannot even find a decent, decent portion of food to consume. So long as that is the situation, none of us can be safe. So, as I've said before, all countries should demonstrate a strong will in order to realize sustainable development goals. We are one of the most generous countries of the world in terms of sustain, uh, de development aid, and we have the right to launch this appeal. The global climate change is another issue that I'd like to touch upon. It's becoming increasingly difficult to limit the global temperature rise due to climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius. One of the conditions for this is financial and technological support for the efforts of developing countries that is needed. Food security is one of the main areas affected by climate change. We must develop and implement the right policies and investments for the sustainable use of water and land resources. We cannot bequeath to our children a world plagued by pollution caused by unconscious, unconscientious consumption and depleted natural resources. With this understanding, we have taken the zero waste movement, which we started in our country with the vision of a more livable and fairer world, to a global dimension with the decision adopted at the United Nations with the joint presentation of 105 countries, along with my spouse, the First Lady. Yesterday, we have signed the Goodwill uh, Declaration on Zero Waste at the Turkish mission yesterday evening. We hope that our zero waste targets will contribute to combating climate change and achieving sustainable development goals. So I would like to kindly invite all the countries, the international organizations and the NGOs to support the zero waste movement globally. Especially the developed countries are suffering from racism as if it were a plague, along with xenophobia, Islamophobia, and it's become unbearable and it has reached intolerable levels. Hate speech, polarization, and discrimination against innocent people leave no conscience untouched around the world. Unfortunately, populist politicians in many countries continue to play with fire by encouraging such dangerous trends. The mentality that encourages the heinous attacks against the Holy Quran in Europe by allowing them under the guise of freedom of expression is essentially darkening its own future with its own hands. As Turkey, we will continue to support initiatives to combat Islamophobia on all platforms, including the United Nations, OSCE, and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Regardless of which faith they might follow, nobody can accept heinous attacks against sacred elements, and I would kindly ask all the brotherly nations to support and follow these developments around the world. Combating all these challenges, each of which I have tried to touch upon in a few sentences, is our common responsibility. And we can fulfill this responsibility only through effective cooperation and solidarity. Quite recently, we believe that the ancient values that make humans what they are are being eroded. These attacks are threatening prosperity and welfare of the entire world. And we have family at the core of our endeavors that we need to protect and that we need to save. So saving families will mean saving the future of the entire human race. The uh, global impositions are on the rise 
in an unprecedented fashion. That's why I would kindly ask all of the member states to support the family institution and protect the family institution. As the Republic of Turkey which celebrates its 100th anniversary this year, we will continue to take steps towards peace, prosperity and security for all for the benefit of the entire human race. I hope that the work of the 78th session of the United Nations General Assembly will strengthen the spirit of global cooperation and solidarity. And on this occasion, I will also take a moment to mention that the recent uh, Negativities happening between Armenia and Azerbaijan need to be condemned and the regional developments need to be brought to a solution immediately. That's what I hope and pray for. I would like to greet you all once again with love and respect and may you remain in health. Thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Turkey for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, President of the Portuguese Republic. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa, President of the Portuguese Republic, and to invite him President. to address the Assembly. Just uh, initially to say that Portugal completely uh, supports President Denis Francis' priorities in his term. Another word to say to President Sabah Korossi, whose term has ended. Mr. Secretary General Antonio Guterres, I applaud you on behalf of Portugal for your inexhaustible dedication to the values of the United Nations Charter in support for our common agenda and the reform proposals for global governments, including financial governance, but also the priorities that we never abandoned on climate change, human rights, migrants, refugees, and gender equality. Portugal supports the success of the Summit of the Future in 2024, the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations Forum, which Portugal will host in 2024, and the World Social Summit in 2025, which are hallmarks of your permanent lucidity and dynamism at this juncture of the world to build peace and international cooperation. Your Excellencies, we heard the report from the Secretary General of the United States Nations. We also heard Presidents Lula da Silva and Joe Biden. And despite several positions, they agreed on the essential. We urgently need to respect the United Nations Charter, Charter to ma maintain peace in the world. We need to accelerate the fight against climate change to fulfill the objectives of the Agenda 2030 to protect oceans and biodiversity and to guarantee peace and institutional reform. 
We urgently need to reform the institutions which were formed in the last century, some of which in the first half of the last century, which are totally different from the today's reality. The financial, international financial institutions, as the Secretary General said, we must approve a new Bretton Woods. These three urgencies are connected. There is no peace, nor sustainable development, nor institutional reform without respect for the United Nations Charter. There is no sustainable development nor respect for the United Nations Charter, Charter without the reform of international institutions. And there is no reform without respect for the Charter, without the goals of the Agenda 2030 achieved and our goals for climate change. But the problem is not this. The problem is something else. What is the urgency? What is the credibility for us to come here every day, every year, to say what is in fact not treated with the appropriate urgency? This has been the appeal of the Secretary General for many years. It is urgent to respect the United Nations Charter, Charter because without it, there is no sovereignty of the states nor human rights, and there can be no peace. Peace in the Ukraine, that's the struggle for the Ukrainian people and for the whole world in other regions, such as the Sahel, the Middle East and Asia, in Africa, the problem is the same based on the principles of international law and the United Nations Charter. Therefore, we cannot differentiate the Ukrainian people's struggle from the struggle for respect for the United Nations Charter. It's also not possible to build peace without accelerating the goals of development for 2030. We are lagging behind. We need to promote equality among states and among peoples. We cannot achieve these goals without reforming international institutions. The concept of security corresponds to a world that no longer exists. Portugal has defended that countries like Brazil and India become permanent members. This decision should be made. These countries cannot be ignored. Similarly, existing financial institutions are incapable of financing sustainable development with equity and with justice. The richer have preference over the poorer nations. And the three urgencies are connected, and they continue to be connected year after year. Portugal defends the respect for the United Nations Charter. Portugal defends the acceleration of the struggle against climate change, trying to move forward in decarbonization, in promoting clean energy, in promoting the ocean, in protecting the oceans and biodiversity, in defending the reform of institutions in the United Nations 
and the international financial institutions. We will not cease to support the Secretary General of the United Nations because it's easy to come here every year and to make the same promises and never deliver on those promises, not to contribute to peace, not respecting international law and the United Nations Charter, not contributing to justice and sustainable development, delaying the sustainable development goals by 2030, to promise a new world governance with concrete solutions for institutional reform, talking about financing for those that need it without giving examples of such financing. We, Portugal, just signed with Cabo Verde, a country that is part of the world of 300 million Portuguese-speaking nations, persons, we signed a environmental and climate fund committing debt to the economic development sustainable of Cabo Verde. This should happen systematically because existing debt and converted into sustainable development. Our goal and that of other countries that speak Portuguese. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, year after year, we lose time. Time has come for us to, uh, to deliver on respect for international law, on building peace. It is time to deliver on international cooperation, on the correction of world inequalities, on climate change, on the reform of the United Nations. It is time to deliver on the reform of international financial institutions. Without this, there is no possible multilateralism. There is no lasting cooperation and no peace throughout the world. Every day we lose is another day of inequality, selfishness, conflict, war. Every day we gain is another day of justice, development and peace. I hope that one year from now we can meet again and that we can say there is more peace than war, there is more justice than injustice, there is more equality than inequality, there is more climate action than climate inaction. There is more reform of the United Nations. There is more reform of the institution, financial institutions. If that is so, it will be worth our while. Otherwise, we will continue to hear all the same people, very influential, who promise things that do not deliver. We realize why nations, people believe less and less the, on the, 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 gov the people who govern them. Thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Portuguese Republic for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Ahmad Al Thani, Amir of the State of Qatar. I request protocol to escort His Highness.
On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hammam Al Thani, Amir of the State of Qatar, and to invite him to address the Assembly. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, Your Excellency, the President of the General Assembly, Your Excellency, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Honorable Audience, may God's peace, mercy, and blessings be upon you. At the outset, I would like to congratulate His Excellency, Mr. Dennis Francis, for assuming the presidency of the 78th session of the General Assembly, wishing him success. I would like also to express my appreciation to His Excellency, Mr. Chasba Kuroshi, for his efforts in presiding over the 77th session. I would like to commend the efforts made by His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, as well as the personnel of the United Nations, towards the fulfillment of its lofty goals. Allow me at first to offer my sincere condolences to His Majesty King Mohammed VI and to the fraternal Moroccan people for the victims of the devastating earthquake. I would like also to extend my condolences to Libya, to the government and people of Libya over the victims of the floods there. We pray to God Almighty for the speedy recovery of the injured and for the deceased to rest in peace, and we reiterate our full solidarity with them in this tragedy. Mr. President, we are fortunate to be living in an era of unprecedented, accelerating progress, where innovation prevails in all walks of life, especially medicine, technology, and science, and where humanity is more capable than ever to harness resources for a decent life for all humanity. The consecutive innovations have led to productivity, prosperity, and a level of communication amongst people that can be tantamount to science fiction. This development has enabled us to achieve a lot of our wishes. However, this came with a cost for the people and the planet. The average life expectancy and the standard of living of the majority of humanity have risen. However, this is coupled with an increase in the rates of poverty and unemployment, not to mention that there is growing awareness of the lack of, injust the lack of justice in wealth distribution and the dire consequences on environment. And in terms of genetics and artificial intelligence, we have a lot of potential that could uh, achieve prosperity for the whole humanity. However, the gap between the possibilities and reality is widening. So, in this era, and as poten those potentials unfold, we find peoples grappling with child labor, hunger, unemployment, civil wars. Meanwhile, the developed countries guard their borders against the influx of refugees, as if the peoples on this earth live in two different eras. The accelerating De technical development and the growing reliance thereon open up unprecedented prospects for humanity to develop for the better, and undoubtedly, science and technology are crucial for increasing productivity and improving human life quality. However, embracing the means without responsibly thinking of the ends to which those means are used have led to major disasters, such as using nuclear weapons, conducting dangerous experiments on humans, as well as genocide in concentration camps. It is incumbent on us to keep pace with the scientific and technical development and to encourage the same in our countries. Meanwhile, barriers between countries in this field must be removed. However, at the same time, we should not ignore risks such as deep fakes, violation of privacy, hacking, phishing, identity theft, educational process disruption by facilitating plagiarism, 
as well as human deception ploys. Therefore, and in addition to the necessity of cooperation and investment in developing those technologies, we reiterate our call for unison to prevent the misuse of cyberspace and to regulate this vital aspect on the basis of the rules of the international law. In this context, the Web Summit 2024 is set to take place in Doha. This will be a very important opportunity to review development in the field of technology and to create new cooperation opportunities in the realm of technology for the benefit of humanity as a whole. And I would like to take this occasion to welcome you all in Doha. Mr. President, we must not forget that there are peoples around the world, especially in our region, that are overwhelmed by the present tragedies. Thus, the issues that I have just mentioned might seem to them as luxury. Thus, if we truthfully call ourselves international community and not merely entities, separate entities, we have to work and to strive towards ending injustice afflicting those people, at least in accordance with the resolutions of this body and the international law. It is unacceptable for the Palestinian people to continue to languish under the yoke and the intransigence of the Israeli occupation and the rejection by consecutive Israeli governments of any just political solution according to international legitimacy. It is conspicuous to all that the inaction by the international organization to take procedures against the occupation has given Israel the opportunity and it continues to give Israel the opportunities to undermine the pillar of the two-state solution to the extent that the occupation has become tantamount to an upper to a brazen and conspicuous appetite appetite system in the 21st century. This has been very conspicuous to the to the extent that even some of Israel's friends have noticed that. Israel also responds to Arab peace and normalization initiatives with more nationalist and ultra-Orthodox intransigence and extremism that is reflected in government coalitions and further settlement expansion. In addition to the Judaization of Jerusalem, attacks on the holy sites and using heavy-handed and draconian measures against the people in Gaza. Qatar provides and extends political, humanitarian, and development support to our brotherly people in Palestine, and we do also contribute towards rebuilding the Gaza Strip, which is reeling under the siege, in addition, and, in, uh, and the embargo, in addition to its continuous contribution to the UNRWA funds. We also maintain our firm stance regarding the fairness of this cause. As for Syria, it is unacceptable to condone the injustice sustained by the fraternal people of Syria as destiny. The crisis is awaiting a comprehensive settlement through a political process leading to a political transition in accordance with the Geneva Declaration 1 and the Security Council Resolution 2254 while maintaining Syria's integrity, sovereignty and independence. It's regrettable to witness this year the outbreak of violence in the Sudan which had dire effect and impact on the Sudanese people and which has exacerbated the crisis of refugees. We condemn all crimes uh, perpetrated against civilians in the capital Khartoum and in Darfur, and we call for holding the perpetrators thereof accountable. Also, we call for putting an end to the violence and to resort to reason to spare civilians the consequences of fighting, and we do stress our support to all regional and international efforts to facilitate ceasefire and dialogue between all political powers in the Sudan for the future of the Sudan. And in fraternal Lebanon, where the specter of danger hangs over the state's institutions, 
We do stress the need for finding a sustainable solution to the political vacuum, introducing mechanisms that thwart its recurrence and forming a government capable of addressing the aspirations of the Lebanese people. It is regrettable uh, uh, for the suffering of this fraternal people to be prolonged just because of political and personal calculations. And in Yemen, we call for settling the crisis according to the national dialogue, the Gulf Initiative, and the relevant security. Security Council resolutions. And when it comes to Libya, we do stress our unwavering support for the endeavors of the special representative of the Secretary General and the head of the United Nations support mission in Libya. We do support his efforts to achieve tangible results to resolve the Libyan crisis. It is clear that solution in all fraternal countries that I have mentioned lies in consensus, consensus on the uh, rule of law, state and citizenship. Regarding the situation in Afghanistan, we continue to coordinate international efforts and facilitating dialogue with the United Nations and the countries concerned, uh, in addition to the caretaker government of Afghanistan to ensure compliance to the Doha agreement to avoid the recurrence of past mistakes and to prevent Afghanistan from spiraling into a difficult to manage humanitarian crisis or becoming a safe haven for terrorist individuals and groups. We also have to work to ensure that the Afghan people receive the needed international support and assistance and enjoy human rights, particularly minority rights and women's rights to education and work. When we speak about our region, we would like to reiterate our appreciation of the detente and the breakthrough that we have witnessed this year, which is represented in the constructive dialogue and the reestablishment of ties between the sisterly countries, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran, as well as between the Arab Republic of Egypt and the Republic of Turkey. Mr. President, the war in Europe drags on. And along with Russia and Ukraine, it is consuming Europe in its entirety, and it is affecting the whole world in vital areas such as energy and food. And in absence, in the absence of a prospect for a permanent political solution, and taking into account the ability of certain countries to continue this war incessantly, the only thing and the only aspiration that people are looking up to is a truce. Based on the damage sustained by the peoples of both countries and the peoples of the world, and, uh, and because the status quo cannot be accepted, we reiterate our call on all parties to comply with the United Nations Charter and the international law and to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states. We also call upon them to resort to radical peaceful solutions based on those principles. Mr. President, our region is blessed with tremendous potentials and opportunities, and our peoples are tolerant, humane, peace-loving, and talented. During the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, there was an opportunity for interaction between peoples, and it was an opportunity for the world to see our people as they are, and to learn about our, our culture and values, and to learn about Qatar and Qatar's status as a global destination and nexus between East and West, and to emphasize the role that sports could play in building bridges of communication and rapprochement between peoples and cultures, I hope. We had contributed through this tournament to breaking the stereotypes and presenting a new exciting and safe tournament formula to the world. In Qatar, we had a dream. We had a dream for our country to be one of the prosperous nations whose people enjoy well-being and prosperity. We have invested for decades in, uh, to achieve our 
dream by planning and development work. We have achieved a lot thanks to God and the solidarity of everyone in Qatar. While investing in liquefied gas was a leverage to realize that dream, this investment also enabled us to play an important role in addressing the energy challenge around the world by embracing a realistic vision that takes into consideration the world needs for a diverse mix of different energy sources and by using the highest levels of advanced technology, which is environment friendly. We do realize that energy export imposes obligations on us as a reliable partner with world countries. At the same time, it makes it incumbent on us to be responsible before our people and our future generations. Thus, Qatar continues to develop its sovereign fund and diversify the sources of its income, including investment in clean energy. The state of Qatar pursues environmentally friendly policies and supports various projects to protect, to protect the same. In this regard, we are uh, going to host the Qatar Horticultural Expo next month. The state of Qatar responsibly works towards strengthening its role in providing humanitarian aid and mediation efforts and to resolve conflicts that affect the world. The path to resolve conflicts through peaceful means is a long and strenuous path, but it is less costly than wars, and our commitment to continue our efforts in facilitating and making peace is a firm commitment deeply rooted in the core of our foreign policy. Mr. President, we stress that we take pride in our partnership with this international national organization, and this is evidenced by, o by Qatar's opening the United Nations House in last March, which includes 12 UN offices so far. Uh, last March, or in March of this year, my country hosted the fifth United Nations Conference on the Least Developed Countries which is considered one of the most prominent international fora. During this forum, efforts were galvanized to achieve the ambitious goals of the Doha Action Program for the benefit of the least developed countries for, uh, during the decade of 2020-2031. We do reiterate that the state of Qatar is a major and active partner in the endeavors made to respond to the priorities and needs of these countries. Thus, we welcome the Sustainable Development Goals Summit held yesterday. We are also pleased to announce that the State of Qatar is once again undertaking a leading role in major debates under the umbrella of the United Nations, most recent of which is our collaboration with Ireland to facilitate government negotiations on the political declaration adopted by the Sustainable Development Goal Summit yesterday. We believe that cooperation in those areas contributes to hedge against the waves of refugees which have become a real problem for Europe as well as for neighboring African and Asian countries. Allow me at this point to stress the importance of combating racism and the campaigns of enticement against entire peoples, religions and civilizations. And in this occasion, on this occasion, I would like to tell my Muslim brethren that uh, we should not fall uh, prey to any idiot or mentally sick person who occurs to provoke us by burning the Quran. And the Quran says, or God Almighty says in the Quran, embrace forgiveness and enjoin what is right and turn away from the ignorant. At the same time, I would like to tell all those who justify those ugly and hideous acts uh, as freedom of expression, I would like to tell them that comprising the sanctity of others deliber deliberately should not be seen as an example of the freedom of expression. In conclusion, it is incumbent on all leaders to empower their peoples and to enable their peoples to live in peace and security and to look forward to a better future for their posterity. There are obstacles at the level of the international community, mainly represented in the failure to subject contradictions and competition between major countries on 
on certain issues to the minimum binding principles owing to the variations in governance systems. These issues, which concern all of humanity, include climate change, environmental matters in general, poverty, and the blatant injustice represented by occupation, racism, and war crimes. This is the consensus or the unanimity that should take place in this international organization in order not to be overwhelmed by details and to safeguard the future of entire peoples from loss due to the unwillingness of those countries to cooperate in implementing international law. And peace be upon you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the Amir of the State of Qatar for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Highness. The Assembly will hear an address of His Excellency Matamela Cyril Ram Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. Yeah. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Matamela Cyril Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa and to invite him to address the Assembly. President of the 78th session of the UN General Assembly, the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Ministers and Ladies and Gentlemen, 78 years ago, in the aftermath of the Second World War, the nations of the world made a solemn commitment to save future generations from the horror and the suffering of war. Through the United Nations Charter, these nations accepted a shared mandate to foster peace and promote fundamental human rights, to promote social progress, and to ensure that there's a better standard of life for all. And yet, as we gather here, much of humanity is confronted by war and conflict, by want and hunger, by disease and environmental damage and disaster. Solidarity and trust between states is being eroded. Inequality, poverty, and unemployment are deepening across many nations in the world. In these conditions, and in the wake of a devastating global pandemic, the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals seem increasingly remote. At the moment when every human effort should be directed towards the realization of Agenda 2030, our attention and our energies have once again been diverted by the scourge of war. But these woes, these divisions, these seemingly intractable troubles can and must be overcome. Over millennia, the human race has demonstrated an enormous capacity for resilience, for an ability to resolve problems, for adaptation, innovation, compassion, and solidarity. At this moment, we are all called upon to reaffirm these essential qualities that define our common humanity. These qualities must be evident in how we work together as a global community and as nations of the world to end war and conflict. South Africa has consistently advocated for dialogue, 
for negotiation and diplomacy to prevent and end conflict and achieve lasting peace. It has committed itself as a country to the promotion of human rights, human dignity, justice, democracy, and to the adherence of international law. From the experience of our own journey, from the evil system of apartheid, which was declared a crime against humanity by this very organization, to democracy, we value the importance of engaging all parties to conflicts to achieve peaceful, just, and enduring solutions. It is these principles that inform South Africa's participation in the African Peace Initiative, which seeks a peaceful resolution of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. In this conflict, as in all conflicts, we have insisted that the UN Charter's principle of respect for the territorial integrity of every country should be upheld. Our participation in the African Peace Initiative, supported by seven countries from the African continent, is informed by a desire to see an end to the suffering of those most directly affected by the conflict and the millions on our own continent and across the world who, as a result of the conflict, are now vulnerable to worsening hunger and deprivation. As we engaged with the parties in this conflict as African leaders, one of the issues we raised was that there should be confidence-building measures that could create a sense of conflict towards the resolution of this conflict. In this regard, we said issues such as the return of the children who were removed from Ukraine should be returned. We also said that the prisoners of war should be exchanged between the two countries. I've just held a meeting with President Zelensky who says that in part, some of our efforts are bearing fruit as the children are now being returned and the prisoners are also being exchanged. But then we said we need to see this happening on a much faster pace. As the international community, we must do everything within our means to enable meaningful dialogue just as we should refrain from any actions that fuel conflict. As we confront other conflicts in several parts of the world, including on our own continent, Africa, we need to be investing in prevention and peace building. We support the call by the UN Secretary General in the new agenda for peace for member states to provide more sustainable and predictable financing for peace-building efforts. As a global community, we should be concerned by the recent incidents of unconstitutional changes of government in some parts of Africa. The global community needs to work alongside the African Union to support peace efforts in the DRC, in Libya, Sudan, Somalia, Mali, Central African Republic, South Sudan, North Mozambique, the Great Lakes region, the Sahel, Niger, and the Horn of Africa. The African Union Peace and Security Council has declared that it stands ready to deepen its cooperation with the UN Security Council to silence the guns on the African continent and to achieve peace and stability and development. We are called upon to remain true 
to the founding principles of the United Nations by recognizing the inalienable right of the people of Western Sahara for self-determination in line with the relevant UN General Assembly resolutions. We must work for peace in the Middle East for as long as the land of the Palestinians remains occupied for as long as their rights are ignored and their dignity is denied, such peace will remain elusive. The actions of the government of Israel have imperiled the possibility of a viable two-state solution. The principles of the UN Charter on Territorial Integrity and on the prohibition of the annexation of land through the use of force must be applied in this situation as well. South Africa continues to call for the lifting of the economic embargo that was imposed 60 years ago against Cuba, an embargo that has caused untold damage to the country's economy and the people of Cuba as well. The sanctions that are also being applied against South Africa's neighbor, Zimbabwe, should also be lifted as they are imposing untold suffering on ordinary Zimbabweans, but also have a collateral negative impact on neighboring countries as well, such as my own country, South Africa. As many people around the world are confronted by hunger and want, the essential human qualities of cooperation and solidarity must be evident in the actions that we take to bridge the divide between the wealthy and the poor. We must summon the necessary will and resolve to regain the momentum towards the achievement of the 2030 Agenda. This means that we must address the fundamental developmental challenges that have long cherished, characterized as well, our unequal world. To address the developmental challenges that face many people in the world, we are required to focus on targeted investment, on technology transfer, capacity building support, especially in key areas such as supporting industrialization, building infrastructure, ensuring that agriculture investment takes place, ensuring that there is investment in water, energy, education, and health. This also requires predictable and sustainable financial support, including supportive trade policies from the international community. We call on the partners of the wealthier countries to meet the financial commitments they have made. It is a matter of great concern to us from the Global South that these wealthier countries in the Global North have failed to meet the undertakings they made to provide $100 billion a year for developing economies to take climate action. This must be changed and the money must be made available in the interest of development. We support the proposals outlined in the Secretary General's Sustainable Development Goal Stimulus. In particular, we support the call to tackle debt and debt distress that many countries, particularly in the Global South, are burdened by. And we support the call to massively scale up 
affordable long-term financing to $500 billion a year and to expand contingency financing to countries that are in need. It is a grave indictment on this international community that we can spend so much money on war. And in fact, trillions are being spent on war, but we cannot support action that needs to be taken to meet the basic needs of billions of people in the world, needs such as addressing hunger, health, empowering women, and making sure that there is development in countries that are vulnerable. The achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals depends fundamentally on the empowerment of women in all spheres of life. Social and economic progress will not be possible unless we end gender discrimination. We must ensure that there is equal access for women to health care, education, as well as economic opportunities. We must pay particular attention to the provision of adequate serv health services to every woman, child, and adolescent. By doing so, we will fundamentally improve the health and well-being of all. The empowerment of women must be central to the actions we now take towards the realization of Agenda 2030. The women of the world need empowerment. They have a right to empowerment. They have a right also to participate equally in decision-making structures of all institutions in the world. I am proud that in South Africa, 50% of the members of the Cabinet of South Africa are women. And today I'm accompanied by an all-women delegation to this United Nations General Assembly. It should be a matter of concern to us all that the majority of people who are sitting in this assembly are men. The question we have to ask, where are the women of the world? The women of the world have a right to be here to represent the views of women across the world. The essential human qualities of innovation and adaptation must be evident in the actions we take to prevent the destruction of our planet. Africa is warming faster than the rest of the world. We are told that the 20 climate hotspots in the world that we have, we find 17 of them in Africa. Africa is least responsible for the climate damage that has been caused and yet it bears the greatest burden. Centuries after the end of the slave trade, decades after the end of the colonial exploitation of Africa's resources, the people of our continent are once again bearing the cost of industrialization of the North and the development of the wealthy nations of the world. This is a price that the people of Africa are no longer prepared to pay. Many countries in the North count their assets in the mineral resources that are beneath the African soil. The wealth of Africa belongs to Africans. The mineral wealth that is beneath the soil of Africa must, in the end, accrue to Africans. We urge global leaders to accelerate the global decarbonization while pursuing equality and shared prosperity. We need to 
advance all three pillars of the Paris Agreement, mitigation, adaptation, and support, with equal ambition and urgency. African countries, alongside other developing economy countries, need increased financial support to both implement the 2030 Agenda and to achieve their climate change goals in a comprehensive and integrated manner. We need to operationalize the Loss and Damage Fund for vulnerable countries hit hard by climate disasters as agreed at COP27. Africa has embraced this challenge. Africa is determined to deploy smart, digital, and efficient green technologies to expand industrial production, to boost agricultural yields, to drive growth and create sustained employment for Africa's people. As the global community, we must ensure the essential qualities that define our humanity are evident in the institutions that manage the conduct of international relations. We require institutions that are inclusive, that are representative, that are democratic, and advance the interests of all nations. We require a renewed commitment to multilateralism based on clear rules and supported by effective institutions. This is the moment to proceed with the reform of the United Nations Security Council to give meaning to the principle of the sovereign equality of nations and to enable the Council to respond more effectively to current geopolitical realities. We are pleased that the common African position on the reform of the Security Council is increasingly enjoying wide support. This process must move to text-based negotiations, creating an opportunity for convergence between member states. The recently held BRICS summit in Johannesburg also affirmed the view that the United Nations Security Council should be reformed and should ensure that those who are not represented, that is, nations that are not represented, are also represented. We must ensure that the voice of the African continent and the Global South is strengthened in the United Nations and broader multilateral system. All the peoples represented here in this United Nations had their origins in Africa. In Africa, they developed the tools and capabilities to spread across the world and achieved remarkable feats of development and progress. And all this was due to the skills and the talent that originated from the African continent. Despite its history, despite the legacy of exploitation, colonialism, and subjugation, despite the ongoing challenge of conflict and instability, Africa is determined and ready to regain its position as a site of human progress. The era of African development has arrived. Through the African continental free trade area, which is creating a wider, seamless trading area and also accelerated interconnectivity, African countries are mobilizing their collective means and resources to achieve shared prosperity. Through this treaty, African countries are establishing for themselves the foundation for a massive increase in trade, accelerated infrastructure development, regional integration, and sustainable industrialization. As the global community, we have the means and we have the desire to confront and overcome 
enormous challenges that face humanity today. As the nations gathered here in this General Assembly, let us demonstrate that we have both the will as well as the resolve to secure a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable future for our world, but more importantly, for future generations that will follow, leaving no one behind. That is the duty that we all now have. I thank you. I wish to thank the President of the Republic of South Africa for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Serdar Bir Dima Mahamadov, President of Turkmenistan, I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Serdar Bir Dima Mahamadov, President of Turkmenistan, and to invite him to address the Assembly. <laughs> Dear heads and members of delegations, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to congratulate you with the opening of the 78th session of the General Assembly of the United Nations and wish you the productive work. I would like to congratulate Dennis Francis with his election as the President of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Today, high responsibility should unite all member states of the United Nations. Each of them should and has the means to significantly contribute to the tackling of the tasks of the UN. Current world faces very serious challenges out of multiple reasons all of them, despite their difference in appearance, influence the course of the interstate relations in a greater or lesser extent, and often negatively influence the implementation of agreed plans and programs on key areas of the global agenda. This, in turn, may lead to the blurring of the very foundation of global security as a principle of the UN, which should not be allowed. Out of this, Turkmenistan over, over several years firmly and persistently upholds the principle of unity, of security, and its integrity. We are convinced that military and political security should not be considered separately from economic, ecological, energy, transport, food, biological, and information security. None of those mentioned areas cannot be secondary or irrelevant, and their solution cannot be postponed. I think that the main challenge of the UN is to provide the integral approach to the security challenge, mobilize the current experience, competence, ideas, and initiatives of the member states in a constructive manner, and step back from the short-term gains and advantages to attain truly crucial goals which will provide lasting peace, security, and development in the long term. This could only be achieved collectively and with the with UN in the main role. Amid the discussions on the role of the UN in the current world and suggestions to reform, it is a fact that there is no alternative to the UN. From the day of its development, 
UN stands as the only universal and legitimate organization responsible for peacekeeping and providing global and comprehensive security and stable modern structure of the interstate relations. This is the principal position of Turkmenistan. And for this reason, we have to consistently and persistently make use of the potential of global organization, its political, diplomatic tools, and moral authority in order to make balanced, non-ideological assessment of current events and tendencies, and to overcome the distrust and confrontational tensions in a in the world politics and try to indicate the perspectives to compromise and, and to consider mutual interests. It is only possible under the auspices of UN in an, in an open and genuine dialogue. We are aware that achieving this kind of dialogue would not be easy. However, it is necessary. On this regard, Turkmenistan proposes to begin discussing the opportunities of the development of the strategy of global security based on the principles of the Charter of the UN and universal standards of international law, considering the current realities and tendencies of global development. In our opinion, such strategy should reflect the existence of new risk factors which appeared recently along with traditional risk factors. Also, we consider it necessary to include a number of areas of the UN into it, in particular, preventive diplomacy as the instrument to prevent and diffuse conflicts usage of the potential of neutrality for peaceful and political diplomatic settlement of disputes and con contradictions, recovery of the structure of trustful dialogue based on the decisions of the General Assembly of the UN and declaring 2021 as the International Year of Peace and Trust and 2023 as the International Year of Dialogue as guarantee of peace time confirmed the relevance of these resolutions in current situations. In order to achieve global and comprehensive security, Turkmenistan emanates from the necessity of giving a pronounced regional context to the work of the UN. We conclude that such approach aims to contribute sufficient specificity and to, and to increase its functionality and effectiveness. I am convinced that the time has come to launch an inclusive, full format and systematic dialogue between Central Asia and UN. Turkmenistan respectful, respectfully invites partners to its initiations. On this regard, our country is taking the initiative to create under the auspices of UN format of the Conference on Security in Central Asia and bordering areas. Goal of the conference is the development of approaches and decisions aimed in aligning and synchronizing the efforts of the Central Asian states and global community, international organizations, financial and economic institutions to provide stable, conflict-free development of the region. We express our readiness to host the first conference in Ashgabat in 2024. Dear participants, among the key areas of the work of the UN in coming years, Turkmenistan considers the addressing of urgent climate and ecological issues among them, we highlight the issues regarding global methane pledge. I have to tell that with joining the Paris Agreement for Climate Change in 2017, a number of relevant national programs were adopted in our country. National events are being held aimed at reducing 
and eliminating negative effects of methane emissions into the atmosphere. We are primarily talking about phased implementation and use of modern green and resource saving technologies, mainly in energy, industry, and transport areas. At the same time, we welcome the efforts of the global community for realizing global methane pledge. And of course, we expect substantive cooperation and targeted assistance from the specialized agencies of the UN, member states of the organization, and other interested partners. On this context, the roadmap on the development of the international cooperation aimed at study of study on joining of Turkmenistan to the global methane pledge was recently approved. Soon we will send this document to the UN Secretariat. Overall, I believe that the time has come for the UN to pay close and effective attention to the ecological issues in Central Asia, overcome certain delays in addressing them, and begin taking targeted and specific actions to create a coherent ecological strategy of the UN regarding the region with near 80 million population, covering a vast area with its unique natural resources and biodiversity, and at the, at the same time located at the region with serious ecological risks. As a significant step to take a strategic approach in ecological issues of Central Asia, Turkmenistan is proposing the establishment of a specialized agency, Regional Center for Technologies related to climate change in Central Asia, which will work substantially and systematically on the topic of climate. We are ready to offer organizational and technical terms for the functioning of such center in the, cap the capital city of Turkmenistan, Ashgabat. Central Asia, region, region adjoining the Caspian Sea. Everyone is aware of the importance of this lake with its unique natural complex in the context of global ecological agenda. As a result of active and respectful long-term cooperation of coastal countries, the key principle of politics on the Caspian were developed, including the Convention on the Legal Status of the Caspian Sea. Last summer on the 6th Caspian Summit in Turkmenistan, all the participants firmly affirmed their readiness for tight cooperation on ecological issues. I believe that it gives a good opportunity for the beginning of wide systematic interaction of coastal countries with the UN. On this regard, Turkmenistan is proposing the creation of the Caspian Ecology Initiative, which will be aimed at becoming a platform for substantive and professional interaction on a wide range of issues associated with environmental protection of the Caspian preserving its biological resources and tackling of the several pressing ecological issues. We think that the re realization of this initiative should be done with the tight cooperation with the UN, its agencies and institutions. Dear participants, as a responsible member state of the UN, Turkmenistan clearly formulates and implements its own approaches and actions by defining the priorities which will make a tangible contribution and serve for the benefit of global goals facilitating their early achievement. Among those priorities, we highlight the realization of SDGs in transport area. As you know, Turkmenistan initiated the creation of effective international platforms on this important area. Let me mention the first ever global conference on sustainable transport, which was successfully held in Ashgabat in 2016. Also the ministerial meeting of the land located developing countries, which was organized last summer 
with the cooperation of the UN and Turkmenistan. We are proud that purposeful work of Turkmenistan was marked by the adoption of six resolutions on transfer by the General Assembly in recent years, which were initiated by Turkmenistan. Among the recent ones, resolution on the World Sustainable Transport Day, which was adopted in May. We thank all the member states for support of the document. On this regard, relying on the state of the resolution, Turkmenistan is proposing to convene a high-level meeting within current session on occasion of the World Sustainable Transport Day. We hope for the assistance of relevant UN agencies in organizing this event in, in New York. The important area of the work of Turkmenistan in achieving the SDGs is uh, maximizing assistance to the UN in addressing the food, as food issue. COVID-19, along with other adverse factors, has exposed the weakness of the countries where this issue is unsolved and where the population doesn't get proper nutrition. Unity, integrity, and determination is necessary when addressing the issues related to the access of countries and regions of the food resources, guaranteed proper nutrition as an integral part of human rights, and the key factor of health and normal physical development, especially for children. It is obvious that it needs groundbreaking decisions and new approaches which will overcome political, ideological, and conjunctural barriers. Consequently, Turkmenistan comes forward with an initiative to convene a major international forum on food security with the cooperation of World Food Program, World Health Organization, and United Nations Children's Fund under the auspices of UN. We express our readiness to provide terms for holding such an event in the capital city of Turkmenistan within the agreed time frame. Dear participants, dear heads and members of delegations, next year in Turkmenistan and far beyond its border, including the UN, we'll celebrate the 300th anniversary of prominent son of the Turkmen nation, poet, philosopher, and public figure, Maktamuli Prague. Whole humanity honors the memory of him and pays due respect to the great humanitarian who majorly contributed not only to the world literature but also to the development of Eastern civilization and of the whole world. And I would like to conclude with an excerpt from the poem of Maktamuli called to the humanity in which he addresses his fellows and descendants, these life-affirming lines, no matter asleep or awake, who will be loyal to his intentions. Let the loyalty to the cre creative thoughts, ideals of peace, justice, and progress serve as a main and clear guide in our joint work. Thank you, for, thank you very much. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of Turkmenistan for the statement made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. will hear an address by His Excellency Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Volodymyr Zelensky, President of Ukraine, and invite him to address the Assembly. Thank you very much. 
I welcome all who stand for common efforts, and I promise, being really united, we can guarantee fair peace for all nations. What's more, unity can prevent wars. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Secretary General, Mr. President, fellow leaders, this call, so many, many wars, but not as active defender against the aggressions. In many cases, the fear of war, the final war, was the loudest here, the war after which no one would gather in the General Assembly Hall again. The Sword World War was seen as a nuclear war, a conflict between states on the highway to nukes. Other wars seemed less scary compared to a threat of the so-called great powers firing their nuclear stockpiles. So the 20th century taught the world to restrain from the use of the weapons of mass destruction, not to deploy, not to proliferate, not to threaten with, and not to test, but to promote a complete nuclear disarmament. Frankly, this is a good strategy, but, but it should not be the only strategy to protect the world from the final war. Ukraine gave up its third largest nuclear arsenal. The world then decided Russia should become a keeper of such power. Yet history shows it was Russia who deserved nuclear disarmament the most back in 1990s. And Russia deserves it now. Terrorists have no right to hold nuclear weapons. No right. But truly, not the nukes are the scariest now. While nukes remain in place, the mass destruction is gaining its momentum. The aggressor is weaponizing many other things and those things are used not only against our country, but against all of yours as well. Fellow leaders, there are many conventions that restrict weapons, but there are no real restrictions on weaponization. First, let me, let me give you an example. The food. Since the start of the full-scale war, the Ukrainian ports in the Black and Azov seas have been blocked by Russia. Until now, our ports on the Danube River remain the target for missiles and drones. And it is a clear Russia's attempt to weaponize the food shortage on the global market in exchange for recognition for some, if not all, of the captured territories. Russia is launching the food prices as weapons. The impact spans from the Atlantic coast of Africa to the Southeast Asia, and this is the threat scale. And I would like to thank those leaders who supported our Black Sea Grain Initiative and program Grain from Ukraine. Thank you so much. United, united, we made weapons turn back into food again. More than 45 nations saw how important it is to make Ukrainian food products available on the market. From Algeria to Spain to Indonesia and China. And even now, when Russia has undermined the Black Sea Grain Initiative, we are working to ensure food stability. And I hope that many of you will join us in these efforts. We launched a temporary sea export corridor from our ports, and we are working hard to preserve the land routes for grain exports. And it is alarming to see how some in Europe, some our friends in Europe, play out solidarity in political theater, making thriller from the grain. And they may seem to play their own role, but in fact, 
they are helping, helping set the stage to a Moscow actor. Second, weaponization of energy. Many times the world has witnessed Russia using energy as a weapon. Kremlin weaponized oil and gas to weaken the leaders of other countries when they came to the Red Square. And now, now the threat is even greater. Russia is weaponizing nuclear energy. Not only it is, not only it is spreading its unreliable nuclear power plant construction technologies, but it is also turning other countries' power plants into real dirty bombs. Look, please, what Russia did to our Zaporizhia power plant. Shelled it, occupied it, and now blackmails others with radiation leaks. Is there any sense to reduce nuclear weapons when Russia is weaponizing nuclear power plants? Scary question. The global security architecture offers no response or protection against such a treacherous radiation threat. And there is no accountability for radiation blackmailers so far. The sword example is children. Children. Unfortunately, various terrorist groups abduct children to put pressure on their families and societies. But never before the mass kidnapping and deportation would become a part of the government policy. Not until now. We know the names of tens of thousands of children and have evidence on hundreds of thousands of others kidnapped by Russia in the occupied territories of Ukraine and later deported. The International Criminal Court issued arrest warrant for Putin for this crime. And we are trying to get children back home. But time, time goes by. What will happen with them? What will happen to them? Those children in Russia are taught to hate Ukraine. And all ties with their families are broken. And this is clearly a genocide. When hatred is weaponized against one nation, it never stops there. Each decade, Russia starts a new war. Parts of Moldova and Georgia remain occupied. Russia turns Syria into ruins. And if not Russia, the chemical weapons would have never been used there in Syria. Russia has almost swallowed Belarus. It is obviously threatening Kazakhstan and other Baltic states. And the goal of the present war against Ukraine is to turn our land, our people, our lives, our resources into a weapon against you, against the international rules-based order. Many seats in the General Assembly Hall may become empty, empty if Russia succeeds with its treachery and aggression. Ladies and gentlemen, the aggressor scatters deaths and brings ruins even without nukes, but the outcomes are alike. We see towns, we see villages in Ukraine wiped out by Russian artillery, leveled to the ground completely. We see the war of drones. We know the possible effects of spreading the war into the cyberspace. The artificial intelligence could be trained to combat well before it would learn to help the humanity. Thank God people have not yet learned to use climate as a weapon. Even though humanity is failing on its climate policy objectives, this means that extreme weather will still impact the normal global life and some evil state will also weaponize its outcomes. And when people in the streets of New York and other cities of the world went out on climate protests, we all have seen them. And when people in Morocco 
and Libya and other countries die as a result of natural disasters. And when islands and countries disappear underwater and when tornadoes and deserts are spreading into, into new territories and when all of this is happening, one unnatural disaster in Moscow decided to launch a big war and kill tens of thousands of people. We have to stop it. We must act united to defeat the aggressor and focus all our capabilities and energy on addressing these challenges. As nukes are restrained, likewise the aggressor must be restrained and all his tools and methods of war. Each war now can become final, but it takes our unity to make sure that aggression will not break in again. And it is not a dialogue between the so-called great powers somewhere behind the closed doors that can guarantee us all the new wars era, but open war of all nations for peace. Last year, I presented the outlines of the Ukrainian peace formula at the UN General Assembly. Later, in Indonesia, I presented the full formula and over the past year, the peace formula became the basis to update the existing security architecture. Now we can bring, now we can bring back to life the UN Charter and guarantee the full power for the rules-based world order. And tomorrow, I will present the details at a special meeting of the UN Security Council. The main thing is that it is not only about Ukraine. More than 140 states and international organizations have supported the Ukrainian peace formula fully or in part. The Ukrainian peace formula is becoming global. Its points offer solutions and steps that will stop all forms of weaponization that Russia used against Ukraine and other countries and may be used by other aggressors. Look, for the first time in modern history, we have real chance to end the aggression on the terms of the nation which was attacked. And this is a real chance for every nation to ensure that aggression against, against your state, if it happens, God forbid, will end, not because your land will be divided and you will be forced to submit to military or political pressure, but because your territory and sovereignty will be fully restored. We launched the format of meetings between national security advisors and diplomatic representatives. Important talks and consultations were held in Hiroshima, in Copenhagen, and in Jeddah on the implementation of the peace formula. And we are preparing a global peace summit. And please, I invite all of you, all of you who do not tolerate any aggression to jointly prepare the summit. And I am aware of the attempts to make some shady dealings behind the scenes. Evil cannot be trusted. Ask Prigozhin if one bets on Putin's promises. Please hear me. Let unity decide everything openly. While Russia is pushing the world to the final war, Ukraine is doing everything to ensure that after Russian aggression, no one in the world will dare to attack any nation. Weaponization must be restrained. War crimes must be punished. Deported people must come back home and the occupier must return to their own land. We must be united to make it and we'll do it. Slava Ukraini. of the assembly, I wish to thank the president of Ukraine for the statement just made.
and request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Alejandro Giamatai Fela, President of the Republic of Guatemala. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Alejandro Giamatai Fala, President of the Republic of Guatemala, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Excellentissimos. Excellencies. President of the General Assembly, Secretary General of the United Nations Organization, ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, ministers for foreign affairs, honorable delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to express my gratitude for the work of the President of the 77th session. I also wish to congratulate the President of this session, Mr. Dennis Francis. I commend him for choosing the theme he's chosen for this session that touches on the need to rebuild trust between nations and to address threats to peace, prosperity and progress of the peoples of the United Nations. Today, we stand at an unprecedented moment in time. For more than a year and a half, we have watched in horror the war launched by the Russian Federation against Ukraine play out. That war violates the most fundamental principles on which the international order was built following the Second World War. Delegates. And do you know what is even worse still? That it would seem that we've got used to that war, and we've got used to the following, to flagrant violations of human rights in Ukraine, to war, to death. Worse yet, we, instead of tackling all of the above, we've got used to turning a blind eye in the face of a tragic and harsh reality that we pretend to ignore. All of this has led to mistrust between human beings, to inequality between neighbors, nations rather, to non-compliance with peace agreements, and under these circumstances, prosperity and progress of humankind is impossible. Today, here, before you all, I declare that this organization is not particularly active. We have food insecurity, people are killed by war, there are major migratory flows, and these count among other myriad problems. Consequently, we need to make this organization work. We need to work together to do that. We need a revitalized organization which seeks out solutions. But above all, we need countries that are prepared to look beyond their ideological positions, countries that are prepared to overcome age-old conflicts. Now is the time that the human beings represented in, among your people, now is the time for them to shake hands. Now is the time for them to be ready to share their wealth and to invest in countries that need to that investment to generate wealth to survive. It is a matter of saving the very human race. It's a matter of saving the planet. It's a matter of having future generations that will be able to live in peace and development. A case in point would be here the vast flows of human beings fleeing crises in their countries. They're fleeing as a result of insecurity, a lack of food, or due to economic hardship. Consequently, under this new order that we need to usher in, we have to build a United Nations striving for peace and human development. We must demand adherence to international law. We must demand respect for the principle of the peaceful resolution of disputes and we must demand the respect 
for of these self-determinations of peoples. In order for these goals to be achieved, every country must raise its voice. Every country needs to say enough is enough. And today, my country adds its voice to those crying out to say enough is enough. My country is adding its voice to the global call for the immediate withdrawal of Russian forces, for the respect of the territorial integrity and unity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Slava Ukraini. Mr. President, disarmament and the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons as well as the use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes is one of the most important pillars of this organization. As a state party to the Tlatelolco Treaty, to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT, and to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, my country is deeply committed to the common goal of achieving a world free of weapons of mass destruction. Imagine, imagine what a catastrophe it would be for the world if the illegal and unprovoked aggression of the Russian Federation were to destroy the... Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. That is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. And currently, its integrity and proper functioning are at risk. And that could cause a disaster of in immeasurable proportions. For this reason, I reiterate Guatemala's position as a country that adheres to the principle of the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. I demand that all nuclear weapon states, including the five, mem the permanent, five permanent members of the council responsible for handling peace and security within this organization, I ask them to sit down and through candid discussion achieve total nuclear disarmament throughout the world. Mr. President, Mr. President, Guatemala contributes to the maintenance of international security through its active participation in peacekeeping operations. As a staunch advocate for peace, Guatemala has committed to the United Nations by deploying Guatemalan officials in PKOs. We are the TCC, which contributes the fourth largest number of troops to these operations across the Americans. Mr. President, we reiterate our staunch commitment to and solidarity with the development and prosperity of the Haitian people. That people is on the brink as a result of a multi-dimensional crisis. That is a crisis of politics, uh, of internal security, of development, and a humanitarian crisis. As an international community, we must react and tackle the prevailing disasters before they become even more devastating. Consequently, if this organization decides that a new peace mission is to be deployed on Haitian territory, it can count on the participation of Guatemala. We will help to train and build the capacity of Haitian forces for as long as that peacekeeping mission remains in the country. Mr. President, there is a project afoot to change the very foundations of the United Nations so that it can have the mechanisms that make it possible for it to rise to the challenges facing humankind. H humankind that is so in need of peace and development. Guatemala calls upon this community of states to rapidly move forward with a proposal drafted under the aegis of country-level experts. That proposal to, should define the substantive reforms necessary in the United Nations so that it can return to the commendable path it embarked upon following its foundation in 1945. Over the years, we have strayed too far from that path. I would propose that without delay, we undertake a fourth amendment to the, our founding charter. These amendments must ensure that it adopts a new approach, that it is in sync with our current times. Of course, these are difficult times, but there ours is an era which brings with it major opportunities. When making these amendments, we must ensure proper recognition for the sovereign equality of states. That must be a reality. The resolution of conflicts between countries by a peaceful means must be an obligation. Nuclear energy must be used exclusively with peaceful purposes. But perhaps the most important of all is that when amending this charter, the members of the United Nations exclude no one. As our holy book, Popol Vuh, states, it is the holy book of one of the greatest civilizations of the world, the Maya civilization. 
It states, no one must stay behind, everyone must rise up. Today I wish to say to you that I am the leader of a founding nation of the United Nations. As such, I recognize that the transformation of this body will prompt a radical shift in multilateralism. That new multilateralism must recognize the importance of inclusion and the universality of this organization. How can it be that in the midst of the 21st century, this organization keeps a country like Taiwan outside its doors. That country is one which contributes to science, high technology, healthcare, development, and many other fields. But what's most significant is that we have kept the Taiwanese citizens from having a voice that represented in this organization. Guatemala exhorts the United Nations to use any and all means necessary to guarantee international peace and security on the Taiwan Strait. Moreover, we condemn the constant and ever-increasing military maneuvers seen in the waters and airspace around Taiwan. These maneuvers imperil security in the region and affect international transport and trade. Mr. President, four years ago, I took office as the President of the Republic of Guatemala, and over that time, I have heard great speeches made. I have seen great treaties signed and great commitments made to halt climate change. I want to say to you all today that the world is in a worse state than it was four years ago because more than speeches, commitments and treaties, what the world needs is action. The region that suffers most the ravages of climate change is the Caribbean and the Central American region. And that is true, despite the fact that we produce an infinitesimal percentage of global greenhouse gases. And in spite of that fact, we are the ones that suffer the most damage year on year. Our resources are being depleted, and we must get into debt to rebuild countries which next year are simply damaged once more. This prompts us to take out loans from international sources, which are only too happy to grant them. But these are organizations which live off immorally high interest rates. However, the reports issued by United Nations rapporteurs talk about the scant development of our peoples, they pointed out to us and they criticize us. But who is pointing the finger at those who, following their industrialization and as a result of their paltry commitment to tackling the effects of climate change and greenhouse gases, cause the death of human beings throughout the world? There are countries that neither accept UN agreements on climate change nor pay their contributions to the climate budget. These nations, neither do these nations take responsibility for the toxic pollution of their industries and far less for the destruction that these industries cause. Is that fair? Mr. President, the serious threat posed by the consumption of drugs, particularly synthetic drugs, must be a source of grave concern to the international community. These drugs represent an invisible enemy that is affecting health and that is also undermining governance and hampering development in various countries. This organization must alter the way in which it broaches this issue. As part of this shift, countries must understand that transnational crime must be fought transnationally because it is a fact that the major consuming countries are those are the chief culprits of money laundering. They launder the money that is made from drugs, and that means that this fight is a global responsibility. We have to put an end to this scourge. The fight against drug trafficking, including against synthetic drugs, must be a joint one and a coordinated one. Information as part of this fight must flow in accordance with applicable domestic and international legislation. It is necessary to implement effective strategies to tackle the criminal organization organizations responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people every year. A world free of drugs will not be achieved without a world committed to fighting against them. Mr. President, Guatemala is unstintingly committed to promoting food security and to fulfilling the zero hunger goal, which is part of Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. In this spirit, we have increased our budget for 
for feeding our citizens, and we have strengthened our school feeding law. The goal of that law is to guarantee the feeding of girls, boys, and teenagers of school age in a sustainable fashion, and the ultimate goal of that action is to guarantee that these groups have a dignified, healthy, and active life. I am proud to inform you that in 2022, these efforts benefited 2.6 million students in public education establishments. Guatemala also notes with alarm that there has been the suspension of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. We underscore at this juncture the risks that that non-renewal poses for food security across the world. It hampers humanitarian operations which themselves contribute to alleviating hunger at a global level, and its non-renewal destabilizes food prices. We condemn the use of hunger as a weapon of war. Doing that is a violation of human rights and of international humanitarian law. We call for reason to prevail. We call for cooperation. And we call upon all to avoid a further worsening of the global food situation. Mr. President, a topic which seemed to not be particularly important, but which should have been treated as pivotal within a revitalized organization, is cultural heritage. Because the mosaic of cultural diversity of our world is under threat, that threat is particularly acute in times of war. We must strengthen and safeguard the evidence of our past. Having that evidence is vital to understand our present and to build our future. Future. In Guatemala, we worked arduously to implement the principle of caring for a heritage and to display our heritage and our millennia old cultural richness to the world. It was deeply satisfactory and a source of great pride to see our celebration of Holy Week declared as an intangible heritage of humanity. Moreover, I wish to sh share with you that yesterday we, the archaeological park Takal Abaj was declared a global heritage of humankind, and that is considered to be the first city in which the Mayan civilization was born. As an old refrain goes, he who knows not his past does not have a safe future guaranteed. Mr. President, Guatemala has long distinguished itself as a country calling for the respect of the peaceful coexistence and the coexistence of international law and the respect of sovereignty as two principles. We've demonstrated that with deeds, and it's been demonstrated that we can settle differences via international justice bodies. And that's the case with our territorial maritime and land dispute with Belize. Both countries are committed to resolving that peacefully and respectively in line with any decision made by the ICJ. Dear friends, the goodwill between parties has been shown clearly between Belize and Guatemala, and that's an example of how you can peacefully resolve a dispute via international justice. And that pathway stands in stark contrast to international war brought about by the foolishness of human beings. Mr. President, Guatemala recognizes that one of the gravest and most alarming threats to life and freedom in our times is human trafficking. That is not only a despicable practice which violates human rights, but it's a real crime against humanity, one which violates the most fundamental values that we cling to as a community of nations. The trafficking in persons is a crime linked to slavery, bearing in mind that trafficking involves the buying and selling of human beings, human beings that should be able to live in freedom as, a, as part of a fundamental right to life. Consequently, in absolutely unequivocal terms, my country condemns this crime, and in this spirit, we have adopted a series of legal and political measures to suppress that phenomenon. We have a public policy in place against the violence, exploitation, and trafficking in persons that harmonizes and enhances state-level action to guarantee the protection of the victims of trafficking in persons as well as their comprehensive care. Moreover, our laws promote the prevention, detection, prosecution, and punishment of those responsible for this abhorrent crime. In this same vein, we have a policy for the comprehensive protection of children and adolescents. That policy is focused 
on guaranteeing the holistic development of girls, boys and adolescents and ensuring that development is inclusive and equitable. That policy was adopted in 2022 and it now is an umbrella for 90 programs within the executive that aim to ensure development for the human beings through, from cradle to grave. Through these various initiatives, Guatemala is seeking to distinguish itself as a leader in the fight against trafficking in persons. We have made this our priority. It's a scourge that we want to halt to bring in human dignity because the numbers of persons trafficked are on the rise. I must might remind you that the gross profit made by trafficking in persons exceeds the profit made by the international, ar international arms trade, and soon these profits will surpass those garnered by the illicit drug trade. Children are snatched from their homes, they're handed over to gangs that prostitute them, and then, once they've ceased to be fresh meat for those criminals, they are butchered and their organs are sold for transplants. We cannot remain indifferent and passive in the face of these horrific crimes. Mr. Mr. President, this is my last speech before this General Assembly as a head of state. And contrary to the supposed truths we've heard from this podium today, I will hand over power to the person who was elected as a result of uh, who will be elected in the elections on the 14th of January. The elections we've already seen were rooted in un unnecessary international involvement. That involvement and interference was unnecessary because our democracy is not perfect but it has been a democracy which has allowed us to have the peaceful handover of power and respect of the Constitution. And we have a, con a continent where some presidents fight to stay and cling to their uh, jobs and they allow re-elections which go against their own constitutions. But we have remained faithful to our Constitution and the principle of democratic handover every four years. And I now wish to conclude the United Nations is facing the greatest challenges of its time. We have challenges in front of it which require us to be strong. We need to remain united. We need to be ready for action. Global peace was something we took for granted for years, but now there needs to be a major international covenant, a covenant which moves beyond differences, goes beyond colors, which does not, uh, but which goes beyond countries and national borders. This covenant needs to place human beings at its heart. Citizens need to be the front runners. People and protecting them should be our ultimate goal. We need to halt wars. That seems a pipe dream today. Today, we have a major imperative to heed. But whatever you may believe, let us fight for peace. Wherever you may be, let us fight for peace. Whatever your situation, let us fight for peace. If we don't do that, we'll one day wake up and we'll have been invaded or killed by others. That's why we must stand united. We must strive so that one day we can, as citizens of the world, wake up in a climate of peace, progress, and development. I thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I thank the President of the Republic of Guatemala for the address just delivered, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by Her Excellency Katalin Novak, President of Hungary. I request protocol to escort Her Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome Her Excellency Katalin Novak, President of Hungary, and I invite her to address the Assembly. Of the people, by the people, for the people. We all know the most famous words of the Gettysburg Address. However, fewer people know that Abraham Lincoln borrowed these words from one of the greatest Hungarians, Lajos Kossuth, the leader of our 1848 War of Independence, who was born on this very day, the 19th of September. Dear President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all for the people and all by the people. Nothing about the people without the people. 
this is the main purpose of the sovereign Hungarian state and the guarantee of our freedom. The Hungarian people want peace and security. We have a thousand years of turbulent history in the heart of Europe, in the droughty Carpathian Basin, with wars, oppression and occupation, revolutions and wars of independence. We know the feeling of vulnerab vulnerability. We know what it is like to live divided and what suffering wars cause. We know how precious freedom is and how painful it is to be deprived of it. I myself was born during the decades of Soviet oppression, when my country was not free. A childhood spent in a softening communist dictatorship left indelible marks on my generation. The rejection of any kind of oppression has become an in instinct in us. That is why we condemn clearly and unequivocally the violation of international law, the attack on another state, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, which has caused immense suffering and destruction and has destroyed the peaceful life of Europe. We are for the victims and against further escalation. This is why we are providing humanitarian aid to Ukraine and to all those fleeing the war. We help beyond our size and strength. This is why we emphasize that there are 150,000 Hungarians living in Ukraine, in Transcarpathia, who share every hardship and struggle, sacrifice and success. This, is war, this war also directly affects us Hungarians. It is not just in our neighborhood. Hungarian fathers and sons living in Ukraine are also giving their lives in the trenches. Thus, we want peace in our country, in Ukraine, in Europe, in the world. Peace and the security that comes with it. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Hungary stands for the territorial integrity and independence of Ukraine. We understand Ukraine's desire to be part of the community of European countries. Thus, we expect it to uphold the values that characterize our community, including expressly the protection and full guarantee of the rights of national minorities. Not in words, in deeds. At the invita invitation of President Zelensky, I have been to Kiev twice since the outbreak of the war. I have seen the suffering of the families. I have seen what they experience when the peace is broken. I have met Ukrainian and Hungarian people who have lost family members. I have met Ukrainian children for whom the kindergarten was set up with the help and support of Hungary. Children from whom the war is depriving a happy childhood. The war and the suffering affects families first and foremost. Mothers who lose their husbands and sons. Fathers who go into battle with their barely grown up sons. Children who lose their sense of security and faith in the future. There is no alternative to peace. The killing, the terrible destruction must stop as soon as possible. War is never the solution. We know that peace is only realistically attainable when at least one side sees the time for negotiations as having come. We cannot decide for Ukrainians about how much they are prepared to sacrifice, but we have a duty to represent our own nation's desire for peace. And we must do all we can to avoid an escalation of the war. I am a mother of three children, and we mothers know in every war Children are the most vulnerable. War hits them the hardest. Although they are the ones who need security and stability the most, these are lost in war. Hungary has always been respectful towards other nations. We are loyal to our allies and our partners alike. Proud and active members of the United Nations, NATO, the European Union, and the Council of Europe. We do our share of the joint tasks even beyond our size and economic weight. As an equestrian nation, we speak honestly with a straight posture. Here we are at the UN in New York, heads of state and governments, world leaders. We have come together as we do every year. 
in the United Nations created by our ancestors' desire for peace, demand a ceasefire and a just peace. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, of the people, by the people, for the people, I would also like to take this opportunity to send a message to the world from young Hungarians. I have asked our youth delegate, the youth delegate of Hungary to the United Nations, Cenge Offenbacher, who is here with us today to help us articulate the message of Hungarian youth. This is the sentence they gave me. Today, we need solidarity with each other more than ever. So young people feel that we must look out for each other, that we must not let go the hands of, of, of others reaching out towards us. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this spring in Hungary, Budapest, in the nation's main square, the square named after the aforementioned Lajos Kossuth, Pope Francis prayed in the presence of tens of thousands of people with the following words. Pour into the hearts of the leaders of men and of peoples the desire to build peace, to offer to future generations a future of hope, not war a future of cradles, not, not graves. The fifth Budapest Demographic Summit, the most important international forum on demographic issues, was, was concluded three days ago. A large part of the world is facing, in addition to war, a difficulty that is oppressing it from within. In Europe and in many of your countries, the demographic winter has turned into an ice age. Public leaders, thinkers, demographers, and the representatives of family organizations and professional workshops from 60 countries and five continents sought answers on how to protect and strengthen families and how to overcome our demographic difficulties. If we do not address this issue, it will have an immeasurable impact on our economies, societies, and security in the near future. Elon Musk may be right when he says that demographic decline is a more serious problem than the climate crisis. Little attention is paid to the real and irreversible change of the world. If there is no child, there is no future. What is the point of looking after the earth if we don't have children and grandchildren to pass it on to? If childlessness becomes widespread, if fewer children continue to be born each year than the number of those who pass away in our countries, our beloved world that we believe to be secure will be shattered. We Hungarians see the solution to the demographic crisis in strengthening and supporting families. Our aim is for everyone to have a full and happy family life and to have all the children that young couples want. Hungary was the first country in the world to put the strengthening of families and the tackling of the demographic crisis into the focal point. We have built a broad family support system. In the European Union, we are the ones who spend the most on family support. This has not destroyed the Hungarian economy. On the contrary, strengthening families is positive in economic terms. We protect parental freedom. We strongly believe that the right to raise children does not belong to the state, nor to NGOs, nor to the media or the knowledge industry, but to parents. Anyone who has a child is ready to fight at any time to ensure that their child can live in peace and freedom. Families pass on their values from generation to generation in the face of every difficulty, every historic trauma, every challenge. The message of the Demographic Summit of Budapest, our capital city, which is 150 years old this year, is clear. Pro-family forces stand up for their values and interests. Even at a time when anti-family and anti-child ideologies are on an unprecedented offensive. In fact, especially then. We recognize that family is the key to security. A strong, united, and healthy family is a guarantee of security. Thank you for listening.
Thank you to Hungary for that statement. I now ask protocol to please accompany His Excellency. Her Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency Alain Berset, President of the Swiss Confederation. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, it is my honor to welcome His Excellency Alain Berset, President of the Swiss Confederation, and I invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Mr. Secretary General of the United Nations, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, we are in a period marked by a succession of crises, by an increasing number of major conflicts in a world full of tension. The challenges that we're confronted with are significant very significant, and I do think, however, that our mindset and our attitude in terms of tackling them are unwavering. Are we ready to do everything that we possibly can to try to improve the situation? Well, we need to do so in order to combat together various crises, the climate crisis, wars, social conflicts, growing inequalities, and also the weakening of democratic institutions and the ongoing erosion of what uh, of multilateral structures and multilateralism. Your Excellencies, almost everywhere, protectionism and self-centeredness and looking inwards are making progress. But we know that these things and threats and violence have never provided the slightest solution to problems and inequalities in the world. It's true that we can all see this clearly. We are going through a crisis most probably the most significant one since the end of the Second World War. The Russian Federation, by launching a war of aggression against Ukraine, has attacked not only a peaceful country, but also has attacked international law and also multilateral structures. What is specific is that this aggression was action taken by a permanent member of the Security Council of the UN, which, according to the UN Charter, nevertheless shoulders the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. Today, we should reiterate this, the key principles are in the UN Charter, and we, of course, need to seek to uphold the mandate that was conferred upon us in this context. What we see is that it is the poorest and most vulnerable states which would suffer the most if our confidence in the international system should waver. I mentioned the United Nations Charter, that is a cornerstone of public international law. This year, it is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is a unique opportunity to reiterate the global consensus enshrined in this declaration. So this is a key point in time to unify and to strengthen the international community, the United Nations, indeed, are the bedrock of peaceful cooperation and mutual trust trust between states, and I believe there's no doubt these challenges cannot really be overcome through isolated initiatives. Our action has to be joint action. It must be collective action. I'd like to talk now about combating inequalities. Strong multilateral institutions are crucial for combating inequalities, which unfortunately are always exacerbated in crises. Climate change also exacerbates social inequalities and economic inequalities. These inequalities spike not only between countries, but also within countries, whether we're talking about social inequalities, gender inequalities, or economic disparities. I was struck to read recently that over the past 20 years, over the past 20 years, the income back, uh, income back rather, between the 10% richest people and the 50% poorest people has doubled. I was also struck when I read recently 
see that inequalities today are as stark as they were at the beginning of the 20th century before the First World War. Inequalities still in a disproportionate manner affect those who are already the most vulnerable in our societies. Inequalities foster in instability and populism. Inequality leads to a loss of trust in institutions and in democracy. This vulnerability is a threat to each and every one of us there, both domestically speaking within our countries and internationally. For a long time now, probably for too long, we have believed that defending our interests and protecting the most vulnerable are two different things. We know today that you can't have one without the other. Now, in terms of promoting peace, excellencies, strong multilateral institutions are also crucial here. We have some things that we can focus on together. The new agenda for peace of the Secretary General that stresses a particularly important point, namely that prevention, prevention, I reiterate, is the starting point for, point for all peace efforts, inequalities of access, inequality of opportunity in terms of food, health care, employment, property, these lead to conflicts. We need to do everything that we can to ensure that each and every person in each country can fully participate in political, economic, social and cultural life in their countries. Threats, persecution, acts of violence, those in particular targeting women, in particular those people who are there to defend human rights, all of these need to be resolutely combated. Young people need to have real prospects for development and for prosperity as well. I talked about inequalities, I talked about promoting peace. There's also a key role to be played by multilateral institution to protect civilians. All armed conflicts are different. However, the common denominator in all of them is an exacerbation of inequality, suffering, and civilian suffering in particular. Thus, strong multilateral institutions are key, including the respect for international humanitarian law. That's a top priority to Switzerland. That respect is at the heart of Switzerland's work within the Security Council. And in this discussion, in this debate, I'd like to remind you that the protection of civilians in armed conflicts is not an option. It is an obligation for all parties to a conflict. Over the past year, I had the opportunity on several occasions to go to countries affected by conflict. In particular, I went to Mozambique and the Democratic Republic of Congo and also Colombia. These contacts with the people affected by conflict highlights the extent to which work on the root causes of conflict is crucial in terms of guaranteeing lasting peace. I was also able to see on the ground the extent to which the full participation of women is crucial to bring a return to peace. This is why my country, Switzerland, is continuing its strong commitment to implement the Women, Peace and Security Agenda of the United Nations. This is also why we are continuing to mobilize to ensure the full implementation of all pertinent resolutions here. During armed conflict, the shortage of essential goods and services for civilians cost many more lives than the direct impact of hostilities does. It also exacerbates inequalities and undermines peace returning. In this context, I'd like to stress to you the importance of UN peacekeeping missions. They carry out essential work for the worst affected populations. And in this context, I think that all humanitarian stakeholders should be protected and supported. You, there are also other stakeholders as well as UN missions. And so in this context, the commitment of the ICRC needs to be strongly defended. The increasing number of crises means that the organization has had to deal with an unprecedented spike in and a worrisome spike in needs. We're the depository of the Geneva Conventions, and we are the um, headquarters of the ICRC, and so Switzerland is resolutely committed to this humanitarian work. The work of the ICRC is crucial for the protection of civilians. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, I have cited a few examples, and we see that there are numerous 
huge challenges. We need to see where are our common interests, not certainly in global disorder that some people are trying to promote to their gain, but rather in a renewed global order that guarantees stability, trust, and shared objectives. This is precisely why we need to take a stance. This is precisely why we need to undertake to ensure that this international cooperation thrives. The United Nations doesn't come from nowhere. It embodies the hope, institutionalized hope of a better world. It was an idealistic project. It was born during a different time of war, of brutality and despair. And it is based on the belief that cooperating at the international level is crucial. It is based on the belief that the world can only be better if each and every person shoulders their responsibilities. And it is based on the belief that ultimately what unites nations and what unites people is much, much stronger than that which separates them. This should make us optimistic in a period where there's a lot of pessimism, but this should encourage us not only to strengthen but also step up our work together at the global level. With this General Assembly, we have a unique opportunity, a rare opportunity to come together to display trust and together to prepare for the summit of the future in 2024 to strengthen cooperation on key matters, to address any shortcomings in global governance and to reaffirm existing commitments. This is in particular the case for the 2030 agenda. It is very interesting to be able to participate in the discussions yesterday. And the SDG summit that did indeed take place yesterday should give us an opportunity to breathe new life into this agenda, because it is nothing less than our shared roadmap for a better future for us all. Let us show responsibility and solidarity to build a fairer, more egalitarian world for not us so much, but for those who are going to come after us for future generations. And we must say this, this is a responsibility that we have to shoulder. It can't be delegated. This is our responsibility. Thank you. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Swiss Confederation for the statement just made, and I request protocol to escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear an address by Her Excellency Natasha Pers Musar, President of the Republic of Slovenia. I ask protocol to escort Her Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome Her Excellency Natasha Pirk Musar, President of the Republic of Slovenia, and I invite her to address this assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, Mr. President, let me first congratulate you on your election as the President of the 78th session of the General Assembly. It is truly a great honor to address you for the first time as the President of Slovenia. You lead this institution in the most challenging of times, times such as have not been seen, not been seen since, since the establishment of the United Nations. I will return to this point again later. We live in a world in which various actors, including private companies and individuals, affect international relations at all levels and across sovereign boundaries. It is a world that has changed demographically and technologically. It is a world in which human dignity is still not guaranteed for all and is increasingly challenged for the most marginalized and vulnerable people. It is a world with a set of normative commitments, including legally binding treaties, which are not being implemented. It is a world where there are many wars, deadly conflicts, aggressions against states, and the suffering of many civilians who fear for their lives or are affected by the socio-economic destruction caused by conflicts. It is a world that has not universally recognized the seriousness of the climate change unfolding before our eyes. It is a world that lacks global solidarity for the implementation of the development goals that we all have committed to. It is a world that needs the United Nations with a reformed, 
representative Security Council that will be able to respond to all of the mentioned challenges effectively and in an adequate and fair manner. We should tackle these challenges as one. If we continue to prioritize national interests, private interests, or just some particularistic interests of individual actors, and leave the resolution of global problems on the sidelines, we will extinguish ourselves as a civilization. In this context, I would like to briefly touch upon four issues that call for the attention of all of us and which require that we all adopt and implement appropriate measures. Climate change, Security Council reform, the pitfalls of the digital age, and of course, gender equality. On climate change, it may sound like a cliche to say that we need to abandon the business as usual mentality, but it is not a cliche. Business as usual is not working. It is failing us all. Climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. The catastrophic floods that hit Slovenia in August are just one more event among the many, many events around the world that prove the point. I trust that we will be able to overcome the consequences of the floods. But think of countries that have less capacity to do so. Think of small island developing states, for example. They are frequent victims of catastrophic natural disasters, but the recovery costs are disproportionately high. Everyone should invest in an environmentally sustainable world, but I want to be clear, not everyone equally. Global solidarity is a matter of climate justice. Intergovernmental solidarity, with richer states contributing more than the poorer ones, and with the richest private companies also contributing their fair share, must be guided by the understanding that climate change is a result of human activities past and present. Therefore, I am pleased to announce that Slovenia plans to increase its contribution to the Global Climate Fund by 50%. Addressing the growing financing gap between the needs of developing countries and available financial resources is essential for the implementation of Agenda 2030. However, I am very concerned that the current geopolitical polarization is hindering collaborative climate action. I only wish that in such circumstances, scientists were listened to more. According to the IPCC, simply keeping our promises would already be a step in the right direction. Sustainable development must become our joint and purposeful goal and principle guiding everyone's behavior. We must integrate climate action as well as the related question of water and food security in, into conflict prevention, conflict resolution and sustainable peace building. Slovenia continues to be actively involved in ensuring climate and environmental justice, including the right to a clean and healthy environment and in securing equitable access to safe drinking water and sanitation for all. During the UN 2023 Water Conference, I emphasized water is life, water is existence, water is peace. It is for this reason that I would like to use this opportunity to repeat our call for the establishment of an UN Special Envoy on Water which will be an important step towards ensuring the better coherence of water efforts inside and outside the United Nations. Mr. President, on the 6th of June 2023, Slovenia was elected to serve as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council for the period 2024-2025. I would like to use this opportunity to thank you all for your confidence in electing my country to serve on the Council. It is with great honor, profound humility, and a sense of shared responsibility that we assume this task. Our term will be carried out in response to numerous con conversations and exchanges we had with member states during our campaign. With regards to the Security Council, I cannot avoid the discussions on its reform, which have been going on for decades. 
I truly hope that we will soon see the light at the end of the tunnel. Slovenia has always been among the member states claiming that a change in the composition of permanent and non-permanent membership is long overdue. The current distribution of seats in the Security Council is neither fair nor representative. Furthermore, Slovenia belongs to the majority of member states that are deeply concerned about the unlimited use of the veto power which is causing us to lose faith in the Security Council. It also results in the Security Council failing to act when action is required. In Europe, we view Ukraine as a case in point. Even some permanent member states have suggested that the P5 should refrain from using the veto, at least in the case of mass atrocities. We are all seeing this most valid suggestion ignored. In this regard, we commend Liechtenstein's recently introduced veto initiative as an important invitation to the P5 to reflect thoroughly on the situation before resorting to a veto. At the same time, it needs to be recalled that the UN Charter itself gives the P5 an opportunity to express their displeasure with decision-making, but still to act responsibly. They may, they may not like a draft resolution, but they can choose to abstain and let the UN pursue without interruption its main goal, to maintain peace and security for all, not for merely a few and certainly not just for one. Excellencies, by losing trust, we attack the very foundations of organized society of our international community. I am afraid that in our digital age, part of the problem of losing trust lies with the science and technology. Inventions are meant to advance humanity. Social media were not invented to disconnect us, but too often they do exactly that. Artificial intelligence can be useful, but can, it can also be dangerous. In this regard, I, I applaud to Secretary General's resolve to form a high-level advisory body on artificial intelligence. We need to find a way to govern the development of new technologies, including artificial intelligence, in a way that does not impede economic, developmental, social, and research opportunities, while not putting us at risk. A human-centric and human rights-based approach to the full life cycle of technologies comprising their design, development, and application, as well as decline, should be the answer. The Global Digital Compact must be centered on this notion. Things can be done, but all actors, including private companies, will need to be on board with honest and meaningful, meaningful commitment. Ensuring that human rights are the foundation of an open, safe digital future is not going to be an easy task. In saying so, I look at the key meanings of our time, disinformation. Unfortunately, our time is once again a time of competing of narratives, only that now they are much more complex as regards the threat they pose to humanity. It is an era of snack news, attention economy, the fabrication of facts, and of increasing disagreements about facts precisely because we no longer trust any narratives. We may have the freedom of information, but we are not protected against false information, manipulation, and deceit. Mr. Secretary General is to the point in referring to the proliferation of hate and lies in the digital space as grave global harm. Big tech companies should take more systematic responsibility for the content they host and moderate. They should better protect users from hate speech, disinformation, and other harmful online content. What is unacceptable offline should not be acceptable online. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am about to say a few words on a subject so important that I have saved it for the last part of my address, gender equality. 
This year we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It saddens me that today we are still facing the fact that half of the world's population, women and girls, experience inequality, exclusion, and even brutal violence. The societal marginalization of women and girls, often coupled with poverty, a lack of opportunities, to receive quality education and exclusion from labor markets and decision-making processes, is not only unjust, it also results in a monumental waste of potential for our societies. To ensure dignity for everyone, including women and girls, we all must pursue this goal, whether in the West or East, the North or South, or anywhere in between. We should start at home, also in our United Nations home. In this regard, I would like to recall an outstanding detail that illustrates the need to take SDG goal number five very seriously. Namely, that it will take 140 years to achieve the equal representation of women in leadership positions in the workplace. This is simply unacceptable. The Secretary General agrees. The achievement of women's full, equal, and meaningful participation in political and public life is part of his new agenda for peace. That is why I am very much in favor of initiatives to achieve this objective, including within the framework of the United Nations. On this particular point, I'm, thank I'm thinking of the initiative from the group of Women Leaders Voices for Change and Inclus Inclusion concerning the alternation of the gender of the presidency of the UN General Assembly. Mr. President, you are presiding over an assembly of the most important global institution. We are all painfully aware of the fact that hitherto only four, only four presidents of the General Assembly have been women, only four in its entire history, 74 were men. We should live up to our own declarations on gender equality and materialize them in the work of the General Assembly as well. This would be a vivid and symbolic way of the demonstrating our joint commitments. Excellencies, as I leave this podium, I would like to reaffirm the need for multilater multilateralism. This needs to be a different type of multilateralism, one that is effective and inclusive, making the UN an actor and a forum fully fit for the future. The most pressing challenges today, and I have elaborated on some of them, cannot be addressed by individual states, no matter their size or power. This must be a collective effort, or our children and grandchildren will be affected much more than the generation of leaders gathered here. We must work towards a new global compact which needs to be principled, rise above particularistic interests, and be based on global solidarity. It needs to prioritize the protection of nature and human dignity. It also needs to have a long horizon. Slovenia is fully committed to contributing to the Pact for the Future and we look forward to actively engaging in the upcoming summit next year. We must be ambitious, even if do not agree on solutions to all the emerging challenges. We need to use our power and resources to put all our collective efforts into action in order to solve them. Better one by one than none. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the General Assembly, I thank the President of the Republic of Slovenia for the statement that she has made, and I would uh, ask a protocol to escort Her Excellency. The Assembly will now hear a statement by His Excellency Shavkat Mirzoyev, President of the Republic of Uzbekistan. I, would, I request protocol to escort His Excellency. 
On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome His Excellency Shafkat Mirzioy. Distinguished Mr. President, distinguished Secretary General, heads of delegations, ladies and gentlemen. Today's session of the United Nations General Assembly is taking place in the context of fundamental changes in the system of international relations. There is a global crisis of confidence. Problems in the functioning of global security institutions and deviation from international law are increasing. All this is causing a huge increase in tension. The geopolitical contradictions are creating new obstacles to the free flow of trade, investment and innovation. Even on the issues that concern the fate of humanity as a whole, such as climate change, hunger and inequality, one can feel that mutual communication has been lost. In such a com complex situation, the idea of preserving the spirit of practical cooperation and interaction, placing common interests above existing conflicts and strengthening unity among countries is becoming more relevant than ever. Last year, we launched the Samarkand Solidarity Initiative aimed at common security and development. Our main goal is as follows, to comprehensively understand the responsibility for the present and future of our countries and peoples. To engage in a global dialogue, all parties that are ready for open and constructive cooperation. I am confident that holding a summit of the future next year at the initiative of the UN Secretary General will serve to address the current challenges of international and regional development, increase the influence and effectiveness of our organization. Dear participants of the Assembly, we remain committed to continuing our policy of creating new Uzbekistan, which is a low-governed, secular, democratic, and social state. Our country is boldly pursuing the path of fundamental reforms at strengthening the principles of democracy and justice based on the noble idea of in the name of human values and interests. In April this year, for the first time in the history of Uzbekistan, a nationwide referendum was held on the renewed constitution which defines the priorities of national development. More than 90% of the voters in the referendum supported this truly popular constitution. This has ensured that our reforms have become indeed irreversible. In our basic law, we have reaffirmed our commitment to the principles of equality of all citizens, human rights, freedom of speech and conscience, regardless of nationality, language or religion. It is on this legal basis that we have adopted the development strategy Uzbekistan 2030. This strategy is in line with the, with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and we are fulfilling all commitments we have undertaken. Ladies and gentlemen, as an outcome of the ongoing reforms, the economy of Uzbekistan, despite the global challenges, is showing a steady growth. 
Over the past six years, the gross domestic product of the country has, has grown over 1.5 times. Our main objective is to double this figure by 2030. Another priority of our economic liberal liberalization is to become a full member of the World Trade Organization in the near future. Since 2017, poverty in our country has been halved thanks to the policies aimed at improving the living standards of our people. We plan to reduce it to 7% by 2030. We intend to increase by several times the scale of water supply, health care, education and other social services to population. We support the UN Secretary General's initiative, Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection. In order to share best, best practices within the framework of this initiative, we propose to hold in 2024 in our country the World Conference titled Social Protection, the Path Towards Development under the auspices of the United Nations. Dear participants of the summit, in recent years, Uzbekistan achieved remarkable results in the protection of human rights. Forced labor and child labor have been completely abolished in our country. For a century, millions of people were forced to pick cotton in Uzbekistan. The vast majority of the population, teachers and doctors, entrepreneurs, workers and employees, and unfortunately school children and university students were mobilized to pick cotton every year from September to December. As a result, boycotts of Uzbek cotton were announced and the country was blacklisted for several years. Thanks to our strong will and determination, now it is all history. Our people have been completely liberated from cotton slavery. The ban on forced labor is guaranteed in our renewed constitution, and the criminal liability for the involvement in forced labor has been introduced. I believe that it is necessary to intensify the global fight against forced and child labor, our experience shows that it is possible to put an end to this. Ladies and gentlemen, one of Uzbekistan's strategic tasks is the development of human capital and training of a creative young generation. We believe that high-quality education, accessible to all, is the most effective factor in eradicating poverty, improving public welfare, and achieving sustainable economic growth. In this respect, our country has gained considerable experience in recent years. The education system is undergoing radical transformations. In the last six years, the coverage of preschool education has increased from 21% to 70%, and that of higher education from 9% to 38%. By 2030, we will create conditions for every child to have access to preschool education and for half of secondary school graduates to obtain higher education. Dear heads of delegations, in recent years, Central Asia has embarked uh, on a path of good neighborliness, stability, joint partnership, and progress. Thanks to our joint efforts, Uzbekistan has managed to address problems of state borders, transport corridors, and water use, well, water use with all its neighbors. Mutual trade between the countries of the region has grown by more than two and a half times and the number of joint ventures 
has increased fivefold. Our region has become a promising center for economic development, transport and communications bridge connecting east and west, north and south. This has led to a growing interest in our country. Central Asia's openness to the world is becoming the main condition for ensuring the region's security and stable development. It is safe to say that our people unite around a growing sense of regional identity and this sense is growing ever stronger. It's not only our history that is common, but also our future and our vital interests that are shared. Expanding our regional cooperation is and will be our only choice. I'm convinced that with the support of the international community, Central Asia will continue on the path of unity. In this regard, transforming Central Asia into a peaceful and prosperous region will henceforth remain a priority goal of Uzbekistan's foreign policy. Distinguished participants of the, of the summit, in Central Asia, where almost half of the population belongs to the younger generation, the issues of youth and creating opportunities for fulfilling their potential have an utmost importance. In order to strengthen cooperation in this sphere, the countries of our region have recently signed an agreement on the common dimensions of the youth policy. We are currently interested in establishing effective cooperation with the United Nations and its specialized structures, studying best practices and achievements of other regions. In this regard, I propose to establish a working group at the United Nations to support the youth development in Central Asia. As part of this, it would be expedient to develop the program Central Asia's Youth Agenda 2030. Distinguished heads of delegations, the active participation of women in society and public management, public administration is an urgent issue today. The noblest goal of our national policy is to ensure family stability, legal protection, and peaceful life for women and girls. In addition, we are carrying out systemic work to achieve equality between men and women. For example, last year, 49% of university enrollments accounted for girls. For the first time, women's share in the public administration reached 35%. A special law has been passed to protect women and minors from domestic violence. We are interested in further expansion of cooperation with UN women. As a joint initiative, we propose to hold the Asian Women Forum in Uzbekistan next year to discuss the issues of fulfilling the creative potential of women and exchange experiences and best practices. Ladies and gentlemen, currently the world is facing critical a critical environment, environmental situation, the triple planetary crisis, crisis of the climate change, the loss of biodiversity, and the environmental contamination are worsening. In such challenging conditions, while Central Asian countries grapple with the RLC tragedy, 
The region is becoming one of the most vulnerable parts of the world in the face of climate change. Uzbekistan is doing its best to mitigate the consequences of the Aral Sea tragedy, which remains a global problem. In recent years, 1.7 million hectares of green areas with drought-tolerant plants had been created on the dried-up bed of the, of the Aral Sea. The support of the international community is essential for us to continue these vital efforts. Over the next 30 years, the air temperature in our region has increased by one and a half degrees. This is more than twice the global average warming. As a result, nearly one third of the total area of glaciers in the region has melted. In this, if this tendency continues, the flow of the two major rivers in our region Amudarya and Sidarya may decrease by 15% in the next 20 years. It is expected that per capita water supply will decrease by 25% and agricultural yields by 40%. Unless we take timely and effective measures, the consequences of these problems will seriously undermine our region's socio-economic stability. Given this context, we support the establishment of the position of the Special Representative of the UN Secretary-General for Water Resources. We are in favor of attracting and introducing the state-of-the-art technologies uh, in the process of establishing a water-saving technologies platform in Central Asia using the United Nations water mechanism. We are building up a systemic cooperation as part of the green development program adopted by the countries of the region. Such a partnership completely meets our interest and is aimed at preventing threats related to climate change. In this context, I believe that the introduction of the Central Asian Climate Dialogue would be expedient. We put forward an initiative to adopt a UN General Assembly resolution, Central Asia Facing Global Climate Threats, Solidarity for Common Prosperity. We propose to discuss its substance at the International Climate Forum to be held in Samarkand next year. In this regard, I would like to emphasize that adapting the main sector of Uzbekistan's economy to climate change, achieving carbon neutrality, and drastically increasing the share of green energy remains a strategic task for us. Dear participants of the Assembly, we need to strengthen our joint efforts in preventing the spread of the scour scourge of extremism and radicalization of youth. Last March in Tashkent, the Joint Plan of Action for the Implementation of the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy in Central Asia was adopted. As part of our national strategy on countering extremism and terrorism, we are placing a particular emphasis on this matter. This includes helping people affected by extremist ideas to return to a normal life and their reintegration into society. We have gained unique experience in this regard. We have conducted the humanitarian operation Meher, which means benevolence in English five times. As part of that operation, we have repatriated to our country more than 530 citizens, primarily women and children from conflict zones in the Middle East and Afghanistan. They have all received medical, psychological, social assistance and other support. 
In June this year, here at the United Nations headquarters, the international community learned the stories from people repatriated to our country and embarked on a new life. In order to continue ongoing actions in this direction and promote a permanent exchange of experience, we have taken specific measures to establish the Regional Expert Council on systemic work with persons repatriated from combat zones under the auspices of the United Nations Counterterrorism Office. office. United Nations member states must be more unified and work together to combat common threats such as international terrorism. I would like to emphasize another important matter. We believe that the recent manifestations of religious intolerance and Islamophobia that have taken place in some countries are unacceptable. In order to promote globally the ideas of religious tolerance and cooperation, we propose to establish in Uzbekistan the International Center for Interreligious Dialogue and Cooperation under the auspices of UNESCO. We take Great pride that our country is a homeland of profound scholars and thinkers, such as Al Horazmi, Al Biruni, Ibn Sina, Imam Bukhari, Mirza Ulugbek, and Ali Shirnavoi, who made incomparable contributions to the development of science and shown Islam to be a religion of knowledge and peace. In order to study the rich heritage of these great scholars and to reveal to the world the true humane essence of Islam, we propose to organize in Uzbekistan next, next year the international conference titled Islam, a religion of peace and kindness. Esteemed participants of the session, the developments in Afghanistan directly impact international security. The country is facing a new situation and demands a unique approach to resolving the uh, that demands a unique approach to resolving the Afghan issue. Leaving Afghanistan again alone with its own problems would be a great grave mistake. Ignoring, isolating and imposing sanctions only, only exacerbates the hardships faced by the ordinary Afghan people. We believe that humanitarian aid to the Afghan people should not be reduced. We call for the, develop, uh, for the development of appropriate mechanisms to utilize Afghanistan's frozen international assets to address the acute social problems in this country. We need an open, peaceful and sustainable Afghanistan that is actively engaged in regional cooperation initiatives and is ready for mutually beneficial partnerships with its neighbors and other countries. Standing here at this high rostrum, I urge the international community to come together in resolving the issue of Afghanistan. I believe it is essential that under the leadership of the United Nations, we jointly develop a flexible and constructive approach to the Afghan issue. Dear President, dear participants of the Assembly, in this turning point of history, we must all consider what planet we will leave to the future generations. Only through shared aspirations and collective action can we achieve lasting peace and prosperity. Now, more than ever, we need mutual trust, unity, and a spirit of cooperation. 
Concluding my statement, I would like to reiterate that Uzbekistan in this path always remains committed to strengthening deep and long-term cooperation with United Nations structures and with all countries. Thank you for your attention. On behalf of the Assembly, I thank the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan for the statement he's just made. I would ask the protocol to escort His Excellency. We have heard the last statement in the debate of this session. The fifth plenary session will uh, continue immediately as soon as this session is adjourned. The, the, the session is adjourned. I uh, declare open the fifth plenary session of the General Assembly. Is called, I call to order, rather. The Assembly will now hear the statement by His Excellency Luis Alberto Arce Catacora, Constitutional President of the Plurinational State of Bolivia. I would ask the protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome